Good afternoon, everyone. One thirty-five. I'll call the Lubbock City Council to order. Today is Tuesday, the twenty-third of June, twenty twenty. We are in our regular scheduled meeting in work session. We uh, have a number of items in work session. We do have re reason for an executive session, and then around four thirty this evening. We will uh, begin our, our regular meeting. We have no one that has signed up for citizen comments. So we will move to our uh, agenda. Let me just, let me sort of quickly uh, go over, uh, go over our, our work session agenda. We, we're gonna um, get an update uh, regarding the uh, a city bus operational analysis and, and some related updates, including a real, uh, some real fresh data regarding the, the, the test we've got going on. Uh, we're gonna get a, also get an update on the city employee health plan. We're gonna spend about half an hour on the downtown master plan and, and some policy and, and uh, uh, project updates. Uh, we will, We'll, we'll touch briefly on the vac a, a proposed vacancy ordinance, which we've talked about, Council, but we've reserved some time for, for that discussion uh, in closed session. It, it qualifies for that. It's probably appropriate there. And then and, uh, we'll spend about half an hour on uh, a COVID-19 update, uh, particularly, I think, of interest are some of the uh, efforts regarding uh, getting uh, CRF money back to citizens most impacted by that. And then finally, we will just uh, briefly touch on our state and local disaster and related restrictions. Uh, as you know, we'll be posting that for, for all of our meetings. So um, let's, uh, let's, let's move to, uh, to item 2-1 on our uh, agenda for this afternoon. Um, uh, Mr. Atkinson. Yeah, I don't have a, do you have, do you have your button on? <laughs> well, we're not gonna sit right here. Okay, Mr. Mandrell, why don't you go ahead and, and get started while we work on Mr. Atkinson's uh, microphone, okay? Uh, good afternoon, Mayor Council. Thanks for, for having me back. So I just wanted to come and, and, and provide an update on our, uh, I guess, the, kind of a few uh, topics that we've got going on. So the first one is going to be our transit study, or commonly our comprehensive operational analysis. Initially, when I was here back in May, we were looking for this exact week to be doing a lot of our public input on and, and kind of unveiling the preferred alternative that our consultants had developed. And so we were hoping to get that done this week. Um, one of the, the, the consultants um, that works for AECOM that was a key cog in creating the alternative isn't able to travel through the month of June and we didn't feel it was appropriate without him being able to be here to number one present to you all and to be a part of the public the public input so he can really get to the granular level of what they're proposing as the uh, the alter the uh, preferred or preliminary preferred alternative so we're going to change that we're going to try to again at the end of July so we'll uh, hopefully be on the, the agenda to be able to provide, they can provide that update to you all on the uh, 28th of July, and then also provide the public input or host the public input meetings around the, the city uh, during that same week. So in an effort to continue to push towards the deadline of getting that, that final draft to you all in, in August, we are going to deploy a, uh, an electronic survey. So it's something you can go to the, to the website and you can see the alternative. It'll actually have a link to their uh, working paper, which will have a much more deep analysis and discussion about the different routes and structures and that kind of thing. And so we're gonna deploy that hopefully this week. And so that'll give um, folks the opportunity to go on to the, the website that uh, the consultant is hosting and be able to click that link and be able to start providing input and kind of seeing what those options are. 
Uh, and so we, we felt like that would be important to kind of continue to help this study move along. And then that way, when we're back in the, hopefully the end of July, they will have some uh, material or some uh, input from the public uh, it, to come back to, to speak with you all about. Obviously knowing that that's not gonna be the end all be all, we gotta make sure that we're available to, to all citizens and that's why we wanna continue to hold that in public. But this will be one method to continue that, to continue to push this, the, uh, the, uh, the study along. Yeah, and then, the, again, we, we want to be back um, late July with the, the, the draft plan and the presentation to you all with the, the, the final plan wrapping up in late August. So then a little bit about our on-demand pilot project. This is an update of uh, what we've got going. We're four weeks into this plan, or to the, to the service. Um, and these, these numbers here are, are our uh, ridership counts that we've had week over week since we began. Uh, the first week, we, we started it on a Wednesday, the, first, the May 20th, and in that three-day period, we had uh, 138 rides. And, and since then, it's just, you know, increased um, on average about 30% 30, 30 per week. So last week, we, uh, we provided 623 rides on our on-demand service. And, and what's really neat about that is the, all of last week and the week before, we, are, we were averaging about 115 rides a day on that service, so it's increased dramatically over the last, uh, last couple of weeks, and we're continuing to see that increase in ridership on that service as we go forward. So Mr. Couple, Mandrell, let me interrupt for one minute. We're, we're having a little hard time getting your presentation. We have a copy of it. Okay. We're having a difficult time getting it on the board. We're working to do that. We hope to have it up soon, but please, please continue if you would. Got it now. Thank you. Thank you, James. Appreciate it. <clears throat> so here's the, the, the ridership that I was speaking of, the trajectory over the last four weeks that we've been providing that service. So it's, it's again, a 30% average on average increase per week that we're seeing, and we're continuing to see that trend uh, this week as well. Do you have any way of knowing, Mr. Mandrell, the, the on, on those, the on-demand ridership, um, how many of those are, you unique riders per day and then is there is it maybe even better do we know how many of these are new riders folks that don't maybe you're coming with that i've not had a chance to review your data we just got it this morning but sure. are there is there a way of, of of determining how many of those are not regular city bus riders that's a good question we're, we're not able to get to that level we can see when when somebody signs up for the app when they, when, if they're just a regular normal rider, they get put into a on-demand group in the system. And where all of our ADA paratransit clients get put into our city access group. So we can see if there's city access uh, passengers that are using the on-demand services, which we have some of that. But to see what would be, be new rider, uh, that's a little bit difficult to tell with the system. But I will tell you right now, we've got approximately 600 people signed up through the app so far. Um, and one of the statistics I'll show you on this next slide is um, the average trips per rider. So right now, out of all the trips that we provided, 1,811 in the, the four, four and a half weeks, the average trips per rider is about 5.92. So that means out of all the trips, one rider's taking about every six of those. One rider's taking six of those trips out of those 1,800. And, and as we go, that number's continuing to kind of trend down. The more people we have, sign up for the app, the more people that are riding, that number is continuing to kind of go down. So we're not going to be so few people taking so many trips, but that's a, uh, about six trips per rider right now. Another issue report, so boarding per service hour, we're at 4.69, which that is basically a passenger, passengers per hour uh, calculation. So this one, we're at 4.69 on average on just the on-demand service. So the statistics that are here are just the on-demand. Um, and, you know, we're co-mingling those trips with some of our city access passengers. But this is just looking at the on-demand folks that are going through the app or calling in when they need that ride. And so we're about 4.69 uh, boardings per service hour at this point. So the average trip duration is about 12 minutes. So folks are on the, on the vehicle for about 12 minutes for their trip, and they're traveling just under five miles on average for those, those, uh, those trips. One of the things that we're, uh, one of a, a key statistic and that we're tracking as part of this on-demand is our average wait time. 
So we want to get that down as close to 10 minutes as possible. Right now we're at 14 minutes for an average wait. So the time that somebody requests that trip until the time the vehicle shows up, right now on average we're about 14 minutes in that. And we're continually trying to figure out how we can get that down. But at 14 minutes that's still a relatively quick service when you think about our fixed routes right now are coming every once every hour. So that's a really a good, a good amount of time to, to have a vehicle come to pick folks up. And then for the on-demand service, we have about 70% of all of our rides are being booked through the, through the rider app, which that's what we prefer. That's allowing that passenger to go to their phone, book that trip when they need it. So we would like that number to be as high as possible so they can take, those, uh, take, um, they can take their, their mobility into their own uh, control. And then another a good statistic is uh, the pull trips percentage. So that means how many trips that we're able to take from the on-demand service and pull with our city access services. And so right now, we're about 34% on the commingling of the, the riders on that service. Which, in speaking with Spare, they, they said that's a, a really good percentage at this point in time, and that'll hopefully continue to grow, but they're very pleased with that 34%. I would obviously like that to be higher when I first saw that, but in the feedback I've gotten from them, kind of nationwide in this kind of service, that's a really good percentage. The other thing I did not get on the slide, but one thing I do want to mention, um, so back in May I said, you know, I told you guys when, when, when somebody completes a trip in the app, they're able to rate the service and kind of provide some feedback at the end of that trip. And right now we're at a 4.86 average review out of five right now on the service, which is really positive. So we've, um, we're, 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 there's a lot of satisfaction, I guess, coming from that service and reviews that we've gotten. Okay. So taking a, a hard right turn, and we're going to talk about uh, our Texas Tech University bus service and uh, kind of what's coming with that at this point. Um, so we're, 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 we're finalizing the contract details with Texas Tech. We're hopefully to have that contract back in front of you all at the July 14th meeting um, to consider for approval. In, in a preliminary conversation we've had with them, uh, dealing with the COVID, here's a couple things that they're wanting to do. So first off, they're wanting to operate all the off-campus routes only which those are all the apartment complex routes that they operate. So there's seven of those. And they're, they're only wanting to focus on those off-campus routes. So they're wanting to remove all of the on-campus routes. So there's three on-campus routes, a Double T, Red Raider, Mass Rider. They're wanting to get rid of those on campus and then take those resources from those routes and push those into the off-campus routes to make more better frequency. And that way we can do some passenger capping so we can make sure we're keeping the students spread out. So that'll enhance their, those off-campus routes quite a bit. The other thing is, is they're anticipating the school schedule to last further into the evening time. So eight or nine o'clock at night, which they're gonna to need to provide bus service for those students and to that late in the evening. And so typically our, our average route is, is coming off that tech service around 6 or 6.30 during a normal uh, semester. And so this is going to push us a couple hours further into the evening, and they want to make sure that they have all that bus service for those classes going into the evening time. And so the expectation out of this discussion with them is that the, we will operate the same amount of hours, but likely more uh, this, this upcoming fall as we have in the previous semesters, just because of the enhanced uh, the enhanced busing off campus and then those those routes going later into the evening. So the plan for the contract at this point in time, because of we've we had a couple of meetings scheduled with them early in the spring to discuss kind of a longer term contract. Um, the first time we had winter weather that canceled that one and then the COVID hit which canceled that one and we've struggled to get back together. So the anticipation is that we try to go to a one year contract and then that way we continue to have discussions to get a longer term contract going you know, three, four, five, six years, whatever that, that length is. So and that's the, the update that I have and be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mandrell. Uh, Mr. Atkinson, before we go to uh, council, did you have anything, anything else to add to, uh, um, did you have anything else to add uh, um, to that? No, no, sir. Okay, thank you. All right, council open the floor for questions for Mr. Mandrell. Mr. Massingill. Thank you, Mayor. Mr. Mandrill, uh, what are y'all doing to uh, get the word out or marketing or promotion for City Bus On Demand? So I've done several news interviews. We've, I've been out and talked to several Rotary Clubs about this. And any opportunity that I can get out and, and present the service to, to any group um, we're doing, 
the, the, the really neat thing about this is we, we can see based upon, it gives us a heat map and we can kind of see where our pickups and drop off locations are. And so what we've been looking at is where we are, may not be seeing pickups where we might expect those to occur. And so what we're gonna do, we're developing, try to get it to a plan where we can try to do some focus marketing in those areas to get them to understand that service is out there. And, and, and really I'm trying to speak to is, you know, go into the local bike shop and just talk to them about city bus on demand and just make people aware of it. Um, the, you know, they're, when we start talking about it, you know, they're very intrigued about the, the idea behind it. And so just anybody I can speak to about it, we are. And so, um, but the other piece is just trying to figure out what that targeted marketing is and, and really looking how we can get the message out to those pieces that we, like I said, we may, we, we would have expected some ridership that we may not, may not be seeing. Thank you. Ms. Uh, Ms. Joy. A uh, question about uh, a public meeting somewhere between the time that you um, bring us a, a, a draft um, and the final. I, I feel like we really need to open it up to some public comment. Mm -hmm. uh, I know they can come here, but they're not as likely to do that if we have a meeting somewhere, perhaps in a neighborhood that you um, determine that you think should have more ridership that doesn't. Have y'all talked about doing that? So yeah, so when we when we have those public input meetings, we've we've found, we've sought out we're really supposed to do this into March, and we sought out locations spread out all across the city, and, and and by and large we're trying to use some city facilities and a lot of those, so a lot of the libraries, and so we were we're going to have one of the Patterson Library, um, and then my, this gave me the the library that's on 19th Street in the Loop, um, but several facilities. So we wanted to make sure we were in the different pockets of the city to give those um, patrons and their citizens of that area an opportunity to come um, provide their feedback. Uh, and so we're hoping that maybe some of the electronic survey that we send out and, and give to our advisory uh, committee for the study, that they can continue to, to share that with their, uh, their constituents and whatnot to get the word out about that. And we can take that information along with having all those uh, meetings in different pockets of the city and really come back with some good information from the public. So the answer is yes. Yes. Ms. Patterson-Harris. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, what do you see, what have you guys been noticing? I don't know if you've had the opportunity to talk about it that you feel will really make this service in the form that it is now work well. I'm thinking along the lines of maybe where deep, small depots or something like that are located. What, what have you seen that you would really, if you had a huge wish list that would make this thing happen? So thank you, thank you for that softball there. Uh, exactly what you mentioned. I think that in my opinion to really make this kind of service work, having different transfer facilities, and we may not be talking something really big, but just something simple to where we can get vehicles in there where people can get off of, you know, a fixture route vehicle onto an on-demand vehicle and, and get that to the section of the city. Um, what I think, you know, are the, the transit study we're doing and the, and the alternative they're bringing back, it's obviously pre-COVID, right? And so I think that the COVID situation is changing how everybody operates and I think it's, it's, it's changing the transit industry as a whole nationwide. And so while I think there's a really good concepts, there's some refreshing that we're going to have to do on the back side of that to make that work in the new COVID era. And so exactly that, I think a lot of that would help if we could run a express routes from different parts of the city to a transfer facility and then from there they can get off onto an on-demand vehicle and then get into, in, into out into the less dense areas of the, of the city. So. Uh, yeah, I, I think a really big key into the future, if, 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 if possible, would be to have some sort of smaller transit facilities around the city. And just kind of uh, piggybacking off of uh, Ms. Joy, reaching, really reaching the public mm -hmm. to, so that they know exactly what is available, how to utilize it, and that it is, uh, how we, they can easily access it, I think it's gonna be good. Thanks for going to the Rotary Club, but I'm just not seeing a lot of those folks really you know, using the transit system. Sure. So making sure that we're getting to those groups, making sure we're reaching like some of those boys and girls clubs that are in some of the communities, the schools and things like that, because uh, some of those kids being able to utilize the service would be good. And it sounds to me like it's a little bit more safer mm -hmm. type of transport than what it may have been before. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Patterson Harris. Ms. Mr. Chattis. Thank you, Mayor. Mr. Mandrell, on the uh, reaching out to the community, it, it's all about reaching that particular segment of the community that you're serving. 
I hope you've considered the radio announcements, PSAs, radio, TV, print media, of course. Uh, and and I'd, I'd like to pose a question to you, see if you've thought of it or if anybody has. Maybe have a, a one day a month a, 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 to provide the service for free, if that would be even considered, as maybe for two months, one day a week just as a promotion so people can see what it's all about. Yeah, so right now all of our services are free um, sure. because of the, the pandemic, and they're going to be free through the end of July. So um, we, we, our, vote, our board voted just earlier today to, to begin taking a, temp a, a new temporary fare structure, will be, which will be a little bit less than what we typically do. And so that'll, that'll begin August 3rd, but the service will be free. All of our services right now are free through the end of July. And I think that's why we've had a lot of success, and what we've seen is because it's free and people are able to get out there and try that. But I think from our perspective, we got to do a better job of getting out and promoting that so people understand it's free. So then over the course of the next five or six weeks, they will uh, take that opportunity to utilize it. Yes, you're right. The promotion part of it is critical. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chattis. Mr. Mandrell, thank you very much for your Absolutely. presentation. You we'll move on now to item 2-2. Uh, 2-2 two, two. Two, two is uh, a, uh, an update on the City of Lubbock health plan, Mr. Atkinson. and walk you through the health plan presentation. Lou, welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Lou Moore. I also have with me Travis Sarton. I have Travis Sarton, he is the consultant for our health plan and he's with Marsh McMillan. And Lisa Hutchison, the director of HR is here so we can answer all the questions that you may have. We're gonna give you a quick brief up Great date on our plan. Currently, we have 2,525 employees that Ms. are enrolled in our health plan. Ms. Moore, before we get started, are you are you live on the podium input? Have you pushed your your have you connected your computer there? Here comes some help right here. Here we go. Lou, yet I'll turn it on. Okay, now you're back on. Okay. Um, currently, we have 2,525 employees enrolled in our medical plan and 5,538 total subscribers. So that's everybody that's enrolled on the plan. On the dental plan, we have 2,511 employees and 5,709 people enrolled in the plan. Of those 2,500 members, 2,212 are employees and 310 are pre-65 retirees. Your census has stayed pretty much the same throughout the years, but you will notice between 2017 and 2018, we did have a dip. And that's because we took the post-65 retirees that are Medicare primary and we put them on an HRA plan, a health reimbursement account. The health reimbursement account, uh, as of May 2020, we had 686 accounts. And that is per employee or if they have a spouse, they would have two accounts. The city funds $1,800 per account. This year we expect to fund $1.2 million. Those funds roll from year to year. So if an employee or a retiree chooses not to use those funds, they roll to the next year. And we have about $964,000 in unused um, liability on those cards. This is a slide that shows us our claim history of our medical and RX. And again, you're going to see the big dip between 2017 and 2018. That's because we took the post-65 retirees to the HRA plan. In 2019, we spent about $7.4 million, a little above, well, $7.5 million in, in prescription claims and $18.5 million in, in medical claims. For 2020, we're projecting $8 million in our RX plan prescription plan, and 18.8 .8 million in our medical claims. In Lubbock, um, the top providers, UMC, 
gets about 32% of claim dollars, Covenant 30%, and Methodist Children's Hospital, that's in San Antonio, is 8%, Lubbock Heart Hospital is 5%. Our claim projection is what, 3.6% and our national average is 5.4%. So we're hoping on, print, on trend that that will be a good sound number. This slide simply shows you the tiers that the employees are rolled in, whether it's employee only, employee spouse, employee dependents, or family. So you have about 49% of the employees with employee-only coverage, and the significance of this shows that 51% um, of the dependent coverages have 66% of the medical claims and 71% of the prescription claims, but that's, uh, there's more people in those, so you know they're gonna be a little bit higher. The average age on our plan for employees is 44, but the average for the plan as a whole with all the subscribers is 35. We got 55% male and 45% female. I showed you the claims that we were projecting. Under our Blue Cross contract, we get prescription rebates and a true up if the rebates did not equal the total at the end of the year. So I told you that in 2020, we're proposing $8 million in prescription claims. But we'll also get an offset of $1.5 million, so that will reduce that liability down to $6.4 million. In 2018, we got a true up of about $617,000. We will know about mid-July if we'll get a true up for 2019. We also have a contract with Physician Network Services, and we have 10 clinics across the city that provide health care to our employees where they have zero copay. Of course, it is claims that the city does pick up, but it's for acute care. So the major diagnoses are sinusitis, allergies, strep, flu, respiratory. We pay $67,500 a month, and that's for 750 visits at $90 a visit. If we go over the 750 visits, the price comes down to $75 a visit. January through April in 2020, we saw about 840 visits to our clinics, but May, we only had 329 and I'm pretty sure that I can explain that, that people did not want to get out during this time. But these clinics can pay, play a very important role in our health care and, and catching chronic diseases early. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. Where is our money going? What is it spent on? What are our top diagnoses? Is neoplasms, which we know is cancer, tumors, it increased from 2018 to 2019, 20.6% 20 per member per month. You'll notice also that there are three that are highlighted in yellow, and that is musculoskeletal, digestive, and genitourinary. Those claims saw a significant per member per month increase, and I'm gonna show you why that happened here in a few minutes. Our top diagnoses on the um, neoplasms or cancer or breast cancer, 7.1%. Lymphoma is 1.7, and prostate cancer is 1.4% of our spend on cancers. Right under prostate cancer, and I, I found this pretty, uh, is melanoma, which in West Texas, we have 1% of our money going per member per month to um, melanoma. So that shows us that we can do some wellness promotion through those clinics to make sure you check, go to the clinic, cost you nothing, and they can refer them out into before it becomes chronic. Um, musculoskeletal. This is 12.1% of our per member per month paid. It increased from eight members to 16 members from 2018 to 2019. This is spinal fusions, knee replacements, and hip replacements. 
We also saw a 10% increase in visits to the emergency room, and majority of this was spouses. 7% of these claimants visited the emergency room had at least three or more visits. And again, this shows us that we need to educate our, our staff on the difference between the cost between going to the ER and going to a clinic or, or a um, different clinic. It also um, shows us that we, we've got lots of room for doing um, different programs and promotions. In 2019, we took the uh, claims from the clinics and we loaded them into Blue Cross. That just helps us identify potential chronic claims so we can get case management involved before they become chronic conditions. So we're pretty proud of that accomplishment. We also have um, Blue Cross run our preventive care screenings. And you notice that we're doing pretty good on the well baby care, but on the physical exams, we're not doing so well. We have a clinic that you can go at no cost to you. You can get your, your biometric screenings and your physical. We need to be creative. What can we do? Can we give um, an additional holiday if you get your annual physical? These can become creative things to, to push people to make sure that they get those screenings. Um, it's also important for mammograms are only at 50%. And cervical and colon cancer, those are real low on our screening, so we have some opportunity there also. The stop-loss high claimant comparison is pretty interesting. We have a contract for any claims greater than $700,000, and this is per person, that the insurance picks up anything over $700,000. In 2018, we had 79 claims that were greater than 50,000 and 32 claims that were greater than 100,000. So you've got 1.5% of your population that equals 39% of the claims dollars. And I have listed the top five diagnoses for 2018. It's musculoskeletal system disorder, diabetes, chronic re uh, renal failure, and a newborn. In 2019, we had 91 claims greater than 50,000 and 30 claims that were greater than 100,000. So we're doing, we dropped that by two claims. So that's 1.7% of our population that is again 39% of the, the dollars spent. And you can see the top claimant is the same. It's the same individual. And we had cancer and heart disease. But something that is, is interesting about in 2018 and 2019, the top claimant, 1% of those claims, 1% was medical, 99% was prescriptions. In 2018, um, the third top, which is chronic renal failure, 29% of that was medical and 71% of that was prescription costs. So you're seeing that things are changing in that area, and it's important for us to work with prime therapeutics to, mo to monitor our specialty drugs. And at some point, we may want to look at doing a deep dive or a RX analysis. So how do we pay for these claims? We have three sources, employees, retirees, and the city. Uh, these are the monthly medical rates that they are paid by tier. And if you will notice in 2020, the city pays $897 per full-time employee per month. That funds the claims for everybody, including the retirees. And that is about $21.7 million. And that's based on a per member per month. And the employees gave $5.8 million. It is proposed in 2021 that we increase the city rate by 3.9% and keep the employee rate at the same level with no increase to the employee. These are the retiree rates. And again, it's proposed for 2021 not to increase the, entire, the retiree rates. They bring in about $2 million to help fund the claims.
This is our dental claims. They're pretty consistent because you have a maximum of $1,200 per person, $1,000 on orthodontic. So they stay pretty consistent. Once again, in 2018, you see that dip because uh, no, no longer offer dental uh, insurance after the post-65 retirees. The dental rates, these are per month for employees. And again, the city kicks in $25.05 per employee, full-time employee. And that's how these are funded. It, uh, we're going to keep those, or it's being proposed that we keep those level for 2021. And the retiree dental, these are pre-65, the monthly rates that they pay, and they bring in another $138,000. One of the things that we're going to look at for 2021, and I have some more items, we've been... Um, Diabetes has been a significant area in our plan that we feel like we can do some more work on. In 2019, we paid 58% more per claimant than the Blue, Cross, the Blue Cross Book of Business for a plan our size. So they have proposed, it's called Livongo, and all it is is a digital health company, and it's pretty cool. So you get a monitor, and it's connected to you, to Livongo Blue Cross, and it's also connected to your primary care physician. So if your blood level goes real high, real low, they have that. Your doctor has your history. There is one-on-one -on -one counseling. Um, one of the best things about this is the test strips and lances are delivered right. to the member, sure, and that's one of their big, biggest expense. It's about $90 to $125 a month. How it works, though, is the claims do run through the health plan. We pay $59 one time for pers the person who decides, I want to be part of this program. And how they know is Blue Cross sends Lavongo the file and says, these people are can be participants. Let's reach out to them. So if they participate, we pay $59 for a one-time welcome kit, and that's your strips, lancets, your meter, carrying case, and a charger and then $65 for the monthly participation. Uh, Blue Cross has told me that the return on your investment is about three years, but they have seen when they have people who do participate that you can get that return in the first or the second year. I also talked to a local wellness um, professional, and I asked her if she had ever used them before I came in here and talked about them today, and she used the word fantastic and she, they've been using them for a while. So that is one thing that at renewal, we will look at, we'll pull out those claims that could be possible and we can see maybe what it might cost us and we'll bring that back to you when we do the, the renewal for the plan. Who pays that monthly, uh, that monthly? It's a claim, it's a claim fee. Okay, so would the, city, the city. city pays it then? Yes, sir. They also have, have just, I uh, believe it's a brand new benefit uh, for blood pressure management. And it's the same concept. You have the blood pressure monitor. It's connected to you, your physician. Uh, you get one-on-one -on -one coaching. It's a cost of 70, uh, $65 for the one-time fee, and that's for the monitor and AAA batteries. And $65 for monthly participation. Um, again, we would need to look at those, those claims in the RX claims where maybe we can get someone involved and, and uh, lower our costs. Each year uh, it is determined how much money we need for our health plan to be healthy. So our reserve is 20% of our expenses. It's 6.3 million and we have 1.9 million that we can reallocate. And what that means, if you saw the high claimant cost, and all it would take was a couple of more of those, and, and it can uh, really affect your plan. But we do have the $1.9 million on, um, available for reallocation for the plan if we need it. 
Each year, we have to report our OPEB liability, other post-employment benefits liability, and all this is is other than the pension, what does it cost to have retiree benefits? Um, 2017, we had a $179 million liability. 2018, it went down to $140 million because of plan changes, and right now we're sitting at $142 million on our OPEP liability. That's what we've done, but going forward, uh, we currently, and this is just FYI, we have a 457 deferred comp plan RFP that went out this week. So we're asking uh, for participation in the RFP for our 457 vendors, and that is the optional plan above TMRS and mm -hmm. the fire pension. Mm -hmm. We also, in 2021, our contract is up with Blue Cross as of December 31st, so we will go out in 2021 for our RFP for vision stop loss carrier, prescription benefit manager, and our third party administrator for medical dental COBRA, the flexible spending accounts, and the health reimbursement accounts. We're also gonna look at some uh, enhanced wellness services and add some, um, we have, I've gotten several calls for us to participate in virtual medicine, so we're going to explore that too. In 2021, we're also going to, um, to see what we can do to improve those wellness screenings. Look at what the cost would be on Livongo for diabetes and blood pressure and hypertension management evaluate our ER visits, partner with PNS, and they have been great to work with to maybe help avoid some of those costs, review our wellness options, look at adding bariatric benefits. And according to Blue Cross in a plan our size, that would, that would add about 0.70% additional claims cost. But um, it wouldn't be a, it would have a lot of stipulations around it. Like I talked to UMC, they have, um, you have to be on the plan three years. You have to have a BMI greater than 40 or 35 with one comorbidity. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to adhere to those strict requirements from surgeon and the medical professions and it has to be monitored. So those are just some things that we would put stipulations around that and see what that would cost to add those. And again, that would be with renewal and we'll see those around late August or the 1st of September. We are also looking at changing our eligibility. Right now it's working one full pay period to first of the month following 30 days. And this is an ACA reporting issue in the system. It shows that you are not offered coverage, and so all those have to go in there and be manually fixed. So we're gonna take a look at that and see what that would do. There's no monetary value to that. That would just be um, uh, just making the plan a little easier to work with in our 1095s. Questions? Okay, council, questions for Ms. Moore. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, if you could go back to your slide on your preventative medicine or, or a plan, some of those were shown those fairly low participation as far as uh, screenings. I know you mentioned that you're going to, in the future, you're going to look at trying to enhance some wellness uh, programs, but... Slide 10. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, that slide right there. Uh, where you said the baby, the wellness care is way up there, but there's some of these other ones that are bothersome. How, we, how can we get people more in tune to the opportunities for, because I'm very well versed in colon cancer, obviously, and, and it's a very survivable uh, problem if you can catch it early enough. It just looks to me like there's some opportunities that we could really focus on these preventative care screenings and try to get these numbers up because it certainly could have an application to lower some of the other costs that are on the, the slides that follow this one for sure. So I would just like you to tell a little bit, would you tell us a little bit about what you're thinking about 
these enhanced wellness programs. And the other thing is, is there an annual, uh, two, two questions, then I'll shut up and let, let you answer, but is there an annual employee health fair no, there is not. That that will that could be put on an on an annual basis. I was very involved in many healthcare organizations, and that was very beneficial to have that annual healthcare fair where they knew they could, they come by throughout the day at their convenience to find out more information about what's available with their plan and also things like preventative medicine. The other thing is, and I don't know whether I heard this correct when we were talking about their annual physicals. Um, do you have a participation rate? Does everybody go uh, uh, and, and get an annual physical of some sort? Uh, and if they do, uh, that, that's great, but also maybe incentivize that, but maybe that's a day off for them. And uh, so I'll, I'll uh, hush and, and let you answer those questions. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. No, we, do not, we have not had a health fair. Um, it's certainly a grand idea. It's very difficult to get the word out my roof was damaged. I had no idea what I had till I needed it. So lots of people don't really take advantage of those opportunities in the clinics. It costs the employee no nothing, and we have very few annual physical, 50%. That is an absolute promotion. Less and than 40%. <clears throat> that's true. No, the, yeah, it's true. So that is promotion. And it has to be, I mean, how much... <laughs> It's kind of hard to incentivize when it's at no cost to you. It's just getting you to go. Um, I talked with PNS and I have a meeting. I told them I would like to have a meeting to maybe we could do some different things and have a day, a city employee day or something. Of course, they'd kind of shut down their clinic for everything else. But those are very difficult. Promotions are very difficult. Screenings, um, those do have co-pays attached to them. That would be a creative if maybe if you have at a certain age, of course, colon cancer or, or colonoscopies are paid at 0%. So it's very difficult to get those. What can we do? We can do health fairs. The best thing is a carrot, and the best thing is days off that we can do. Ms. Patterson-Harris. Thank you. Uh, just kind of uh, address what you were talking about with regard to uh, having health fairs and whatnot. I, when I was with the county, we had those often, but still people did not uh, take the time to come and, and get the information and get some of the screenings that were available. So I think it's like it, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a mentality about, or I don't know if it's a fear of going to find out, and if you go to, to find out, you might get some information if you go. So I, I'm like, I think it's a great idea, just being able to really grab people and have them show up is a priceless thing. So if you ever figure that one out, man, you, you, you've really got it. Well, um, one thing that we can do um, is look at the premiums. Yeah. So if I go and have my annual physical, if they're $22, I pay $18 if I went and got my annual physical. We can look at some of those, those options. Yeah. Um, we'd have to partner with someone to make sure that we get, got those claims. Blue Cross can help us with that. But we may look at that. Yeah. And you are right. One of the things that they fear of is the city knows my business. The city knows I have high blood pressure. So we've had to fight that a lot, but if you make it enough difference between the premiums, you will get people involved. Did that answer your question, Randy? Ms. Uh, is, that it? is that all, Ms. Patterson? Well, I wanted to comment, go, Ms. go to a pay, a slide number eight, and I hope I didn't miss you giving information, but when you were on that, that page, you noted the three top, uh, the highlighted diagnostic uh, categories and you indicated that you would kind of go back and kind of say why a little bit more. Did I miss that? Did you say why and I missed it? Why I was pointing them out, because okay. those are part of our high claimant costs. Okay. Okay. And so they're gonna be the top diagnosis. Okay, thank you. Ms. Joy? I think my comments are a little bit aligned with what you're talking about with reduction, uh, if they have their annual physicals. Uh, 
but when you look at the cost of health insurance for employees and even their families, these, and I come from private sector, they're very low. And I think our employees need to be responsible for their health given the fact that the city is paying, what's the total amount we paid? We paid this year for this fiscal year? What's the city contribution? It was, total was? 21709441. Let's call it 22 million. Yeah, 22 million dollars that goes to pay for those claims. And that's above and beyond what may be reimbursed for the cost uh, of the health insurance. So we have to do a better job of focusing on health. I think Mr. Christian's idea about a health fair and making it mandatory is something that we can do. None of us want to know their business, but that's an issue that can be worked around, uh, the confidentiality, all of that. But we have to have more cooperation from our employees. Uh, otherwise, this is just not acceptable. I agree. I do like your idea. You know, if they do certain things and maybe they're rate is a little less, uh, but they're only paying, it. the proposed amount is $21.50 a month for an employee. And you're gonna have to make it, if, it's, if you make it $20, they're gonna like, oh it's well, not, that's, that's exactly not that right. big deal. So it's gonna have to be drastically different. Yeah. Okay. And that does take down your revenues from coming in too, so. That's right, so back to the drawing board, I guess is all I'm saying. We've gotta work it's, on it's this. It's tough. It, wellness is tough. It's tough to get people to participate. Um, those that do always seem to enjoy it. Um, I've, I've done biometric screenings in, in all locations and it was great. The employees loved it because they were getting um, the attention. But the, the key there is to make sure you follow up. So if, if someone's blood pressure is out of, off the roof, are you going following up a month later? and we have to get the claims integrated. So it's, it's a tough deal, but it can be done. Maybe we need to uh, install blood pressure monitors <laughs> throughout the building. I, I don't know, the Livongo sounds okay, but it comes at a price. Yes, ma'am. And we don't know really what that would be because we don't know how many people would participate. Mm -hmm. So I think we just need to keep working at it and see what we can do to make it, be make it better for everybody. Okay, thanks. Mr. Massigill. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you for the presentation. It was very informative. The, the health plan is important to um, be briefed on, I think. Uh, first question is not noticing that the um, employee side of the uh, premiums are unchanged. Uh, have we, uh, what do we expect for next year? Because we know the healthy way to manage the plan is to index those premiums every year. And that may be a Jared Atkinson question. Mayor, can you turn to Jared's mic on? Mr. Atkinson. Thank you, Mayor. Councilman, uh, <clears throat> excellent question. If you'll recall, it's, it's fallen off our slide from where we made those big changes coming off of the end of 17 for the, for the following plan year. The commitment that we made to the council at that time was twofold. One, we did ask to be allowed to keep those extra dollars in the reserve. And we did that because at the time we had a $250,000 stop loss policy that was extremely expensive. So we, we chose kind of to manage our own risk but out of our own pocket. And while that's still a big number, we're still to the good side of that. So thank you for that. Second though, we came to council and committed that no longer, and I went to staff and I continue to go to staff, no longer would the city's health, city side of the health plan ledger be able to absorb all of the cost changes. That is what was done for an extended period of time. Two and a half years ago, your employer, three years ago, your employee premiums were zero dollars. 
So we made a change. It's, it's not huge, and those of you all in the private market are well aware uh, of how beneficial this plan is. Uh, and that benefit or that subsidy ratio gets bigger and bigger as you move down into employee, spouse, child, family. So the commitment to the council, the commitment to the uh, employees was we're not going to be able to carry all this on one side. We'll move them both. Um, and we did that last year. That was the first full year that we were completed, and, and we brought it up. Again, not significant and not compared to the market, but for some of the employees, it, uh, it really was. This year, we proposed to hold it flat, and we proposed to do that for one year and one year only. So I will be coming to you during the budget uh, and showing that in great detail and, and why. So there is an increase on the city side, but I think we're in a different situation right now with what we uh, what we can afford to carry next year for our employees. So to answer the question directly, the second year we will have to come back and you'll have to start moving these up. And to speak to the question Mr. Massengale didn't ask, but I think Ms. Joy really got us very close to it. If we're going to use premium as incentive, you're not going to make that happen at $21.50. Right. So I, I do find some potential in that. I've been through a program where a day off did good in terms of getting screenings and so forth. But after analyzing it for an extended period of time, we never saw a significant increase in preventive treatment. So we went and we got the physicals, but that's just step one. You, you've got to get ahead of it, something like the diabetes management that, uh, you know, that Lou's talking about. So there's going to have to be big changes coming. I'm just not predicting them for the FY21 budget. Thank, thank you, Mr. Atkinson. And, and I completely understand the environment we're in and appreciate how you made your decision for this year. I guess I would just add that I like wellness programs. By the way, we haven't made that decision yet. It would, right. that, that's, that's not true. until 20. That's a good point. That's correct. Part of our It'll budget be presented. That's, that's, good point. that's just a, that's just proposed at the moment. That's that's correct. My apologies. And then the the other comment I would make is that uh, I like wellness programs. I've participated and worked on another plan where we we did we incentivized employees that participated in wellness. I think monetarily, the mayor worked with me on that plan if I'm remembering that correctly. And so, uh, you know, I I would encourage us to look at any and all options that we could to continue. Maybe we stair-step our wellness every year and continue to work on it because I think it's beneficial. Okay, I agree. Thank you, Mr. Massengill. Ms. Moore, um, let's look at page 12 for a minute. And, uh, the, well, maybe I, got the, maybe I have the wrong page. The page that shows your funding sources. So that's my 12. Okay. Um, do th some, or maybe somebody, help me with the math. How does the uh, city piece go up 4%, but the cost only go up uh, 200,000, 201,000? It's a difference in census. So we have that many fewer employees? Involved in the plan. That, that was based on... Um, I believe the May 31st. Well, yeah, but we're down. We've got a hiring freeze on. Right. We're 7% down on last time we were reported. We were we had 7% open positions. So that this is, that's disingenuous. That's not, a, that's a snapshot. If we're going to do it, we should be snapshotting on, on full, on funded positions, right? We're not, you're, you suggesting we're, we're going down that many positions next year? Okay. So we need that. One. We need that updated because that that's uh, that doesn't paint the whole story, the whole picture on that. Um, you know, I I can't tell you how frustrated I am that we give we have free physicals, free, and we have less than forty percent of our people get a physical. Let me say it again: less than forty percent of our people get a physical, and they're free. We don't do a, we're not doing a, an annual finger, we're not doing a finger prick or, or a blood draw or anything, are we? You can get those at the No, clinics. but we're not, we don't require, we don't give an incentive for that if no, they do No, we do, do not. I mean, I, you don't, y'all don't want to hear my speech, uh, but you're on the right track, Lou. Um, there's nothing on your page, your where we need to go page that I disagree with. 
Um, the Lavongo plan, I've never used their plan, but I've seen diabetes plans work. They pay for themselves over and over and over. Most importantly, what we're going to do is save lives. We've That's got right. to have people getting their physicals to understand what's wrong. Um, because we're going to, with, a, a, with 2,300 employees, we've got people that have cancer that don't know about it. We've got people that have developed pre-diabetic conditions. They're not aware of it. We've got to get those people, um, we've got to get them the right care. It's not for what they do for the city. It's for their life. It's for their, their spouse. It's for their, their kids, their grandkids. It's for their, their, who they are as a person. And that's part of our commitment. And we're in contract, I think, with, with, our, with our, you know, we're partners with our employees in that regard. And so um, we've got to continue to work on it. I'm a big fan of the incentives. Um, as far as I'm concerned, you can get rid of the employee premium if they're willing to play, if they're willing to be a partner in, um, you know, what we're, you know, what we're talking about. It's $250 a year. It's a rounding error in, in what will be about a $23.5, $24 million city, uh, our part of the contribution next year. So, I mean, we, we just have to continue to think differently. If you plateau on a health plan, you're going backwards. You've got to get better every year, and that means that everybody's got to get more engaged. Health care is not getting less expensive, and it's certainly – Unfortunately, not getting less complex, but you can't get a much less, you can't get an easier plan than what we have. And that is, it's free to go to a PNS clinic and you get a free physical every year. And then your screenings are just with a copay, right? That's correct. The world should have as good a health care as our. As people that are on this plan do. It's a fabulous plan. It is. And we need to really make sure we're taking advantage of it. Lecture over, Mr. Atkinson. <clears throat> I'm sorry, you look like you, you just turned your button on. I think I tried to go green and it went red or vice versa. Mr. Christian. I just want one last comment, Mr. Mayor. The more we discuss this plan and the benefits and how great a plan it is, in the free health screenings, we have, what, 40%, 40 did you say, Mr. Mayor, somewhere in that neighborhood, of people in. participating? I know a lot of people that would like to have a free health scares, uh, screening. The more I think about it, the angrier I get that we don't have a higher percentage of our em city employees taking advantage of that screening. That's unfair to them. It's unfair to their families and it's unfair to the city of Lubbock. And if we have to get punitive for people not taking advantage of those health care screenings, I'll be right behind preaching it, that we need, that you're, you may lose your coverage. I don't know if we could ever do that, but if it comes to that, we need to do everything we can to at least double that to 80, to 90, to 100%. It's costing us a fortune, and as Mr. the mayor said, it's costing people their lives, and it's costing them their quality of life, too. This is ridiculous. It is absolutely ridiculous that we have that low a percentage of people doing, uh, having annual physicals and then not following up with treatment. That's true. I'm sorry, but this really makes me mad. My apologies, Mr. Mayor. Ms. Joy? I, I was going to put Chief Bogerson on the, <laughs> on the spot. How do we handle these physicals with... Fire, firemen. Good afternoon. Afternoon, Chief. Uh, the firefighters go through a mandatory physical every year that's specific to uh, NFPA standards. Mm -hmm. We handle it through the Life Scan program, which does some scanning of their internal organs, looking for cancers. Of course, a full blood test, but there's also a physical fitness component to it to make sure they're meeting applicable firefighting standards. And so, uh, you may not know the answer to this. What about the police department? Do we? I don't see anybody from PD here right now. Chief Mitchell had to step out for a minute. I'm really not sure what they okay. do, Mr. Atkinson. Well, how many employees do you have? How many firemen? 406 I mean, sworn. Okay, and they all have physicals every year. Yes, ma'am. And they're more, really, more detailed than what we're talking about here. Yes, ma'am. It, it, it's. 
of course, all the medical aspects, blood draw. They look at just different medical components, but they also do a physical fitness component. Okay. So I guess my point is, if, if you take the fact that there's 400 and, would you say six? Yes, ma'am. People, uh, or firemen, who are doing physicals every year, and you, if you add to that the police, that makes our numbers look even worse in terms of the rest of our employees. Yes, ma'am. So, it does work. Yes, ma'am. I know the screens that we've done through the last scan program have, have caught cancers early on and they were able to be treated. Uh, we've saved a couple of lives with our medical screenings. Okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. It very well might. We might want to look at that total number of screenings and it, it probably would make our number look better um, if we added our Police and are police and fire in there? Do they count in that in that number? Do you know, Lou? They are counted in the, the group as a whole. So yes, they would be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thanks, thank Chief. You. All right, Lou. Thank you very much. We thank need to you. we need to move on. Good good work. We appreciate it. Okay. Next is uh, item 2-3, it's an update on some uh, downtown master plan, uh, wanting some uh, update on some policy and projects, and I think wanting uh, some input from council. Um, Mr. Atkinson, do you have any uh, anything on this before we get going? Mr. Atkinson. Thank you, Mayor, yes, uh, appreciate the lead in. Mr. Rardi is gonna start taking you now into the next steps, the implementation of the recently approved downtown master plan. There's two particular items um, that she's gonna go over today for which we would really value your input. Um, the first of that is related to the downtown parking ratios, and the second is the discussion of the potential downtown Park. So certainly the entire presentation is available for questions and comment. Those two items in particular, I, I think we can uh, start making some jumps forward on that and uh, look forward to your feedback. Mr. Rardy. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Afternoon. I don't actually know how to get my presentation up there. Must have to hold your mouth exact somehow right today. Foot, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, James. I wanted to start out today um, just to voice a little bit of excitement. Um, I have with me today Mr. Robert Taylor, our, um, the chairman of our downtown TIF district board, and then also Mr. Mont McClendon with our master developer. And Mr. Taylor and I were visiting before this presentation today, and he made a comment, and one of my favorite things to do is st steal his best lines so I can give them to you before he has a chance to. Um, but commented on the fact that this is the first day um, that we will present to you implementation of the downtown master plan. And to, uh, to reassure you that this is not a plan that's gonna sit on the shelf. Our, um, our team is excited about what you all approved at the last council meeting. We're appreciative of that and we're excited to get started. So um, it's, a, it's an exciting day in history for us. Topics we're going to look at today um, are the downtown crosswalk policy. This is an internal policy, so just wanted to give you an idea of what staff is looking at um, for our internal process and make sure that we're on the same page with the desires of the council. I want to talk to you about a possible reduction in our parking ratios for the CBD, CBD districts. Um, look at a potential power at the pole policy, so providing power at our streetlight fixtures um, and other areas in the downtown for um, events. I wanted to give you an update on our progress on the Broadway Tunnel Project and then also talk to you about the Civic Park. One of the things, and um, Mayor, you mentioned it and the city manager mentioned it as well, um, you will not see the vacancy ordinance on this slide for today. We have reserved that conversation for closed session. 
So I'll start with the decorative crosswalks. As I mentioned, this will be an internal policy within city staff. Um, a couple of things I wanted to point out on this policy. The decorative crosswalks at this time will be reserved for um, areas within the CBD TIF boundaries. So this is something that will be specific to downtown only at this time, not um, citywide. And what we are recommending is that any proposal for a creative crosswalk be submitted to the city manager's office for review by our staff. Um, we will then seek approval from both the CBD TIF board and the Museum and Arts Subcommittee of Civic Lubbock, Inc. They are currently the entity that reviews any public art that's going to be put on city property. And so we feel like it's appropriate for them to review these proposals as well. Once those two entities have signed off on a proposal, then it will go before two departments within city staff for approval. That would be public works and then traffic operations. And the primary reason for that um, is what you'll see on bullet point two, that we are requesting that any design in a creative crosswalk fall between those two white transverse lines that designate it as a crosswalk. That's primarily for pedestrian safety. Um, but we also want to review any colors that would be used in a crosswalk or any designs that could potentially be distracting to drivers. And um, we want to be really intentional um, as we do these fun creative ideas in downtown that we're also protecting both drivers and pedestrians um, in these areas. As a reminder, this is just for the public's um, perspective, this, these are the boundaries of the CBD TIF, so this is where this policy would be applied. And then you'll see again our test installation, which was scheduled to be installed this week. Um, when our traffic department went out to review this site, um, there's a little bit of roadway work that needs to be done before we can paint at this intersection. So we are um, getting quotes right now to um, put a, re a seal coat down at this intersection to resurface it and before we paint on top of it. So you should see this installation take place in the next 30 days. Move now to our parking ratio reduction. And just so you all are aware, Brian Isom is here as well for any questions if, if we get outside of my knowledge of our current code regarding parking ratios. Um, he's here to answer any questions as well. But You'll remember from the master plan, um, we had a lot of conversation on parking in the downtown versus available parking in the downtown. And the consultant's initial study identified that about 30% of our surface area in the downtown is covered in surface parking. It's about 15,000 spaces. And so comparatively, when we look at our parking requirements versus other downtowns that are similar size to us, we average about two times higher when it comes to our parking requirements as other cities. And one of the things that was identified in the master plan is that um, our consultants made the assumption that our existing parking supply could actually accommodate the demand of the proposed developments that they were making through that master plan if we added no parking spaces to what we have in our inventory now just by adjusting our parking ratios. So I've given you a list here. We have started this process of um, writing the ratios in the downtown for some specific uses. Um, that's your microbrewery, microwinery, restaurants that serve alcohol, um, things like that. We, um, underneath that, you'll see what our current requirements are. And the main thing to point out, what you'll see in other cities that you don't currently see in Lubbock are any sort of reductions or discounts for the downtown district. So on average, citywide, our ratios, again, are about two times what a similar city would be. But then most cities also offer up to a 30% discount on that ratio for downtown districts. So we tend to be pretty significantly higher than other similar cities. And you can see an example on the bottom of this slide, um, our current requirements for an office building, for example, are five spaces per 1,000 square feet. A comparable city, again, this is citywide, would be two and a half spaces per 1,000 square feet, and that's before any additional reductions for a downtown district. 
I've included a couple of comparisons here just really to give you an idea of the range of reductions that we have available to us um, that other cities are doing. Um, you can see some of our like cities have no parking requirements in the downtown. Some have reductions based on the usage, based on certain usages. Um, some offer on-street parking as allowable in um, your total parking requirement counts. So we currently do not allow businesses to count any on-street parking that's adjacent to their building in their requirements. Um, you do see that in a lot of other cities. So this just kind of gives you an idea of the range of um, possibilities that we have when we look at how to right size our ratios for downtown. The Unified Development Code is looking at parking. This again is throughout the city of Lubbock. Um, and that presentation will be a part of module three, which staff is supposed to receive from the consultants in late July. Um, Based on what we have seen from them so far, we believe that they will be rec recommending a significant reduction in our parking requirements. Um, we don't have those numbers yet, but again, plan to in the next 30 days. What we are recommending now is that we test a parking reduction in the downtown only. So based on the numbers I've presented to you today, we could see a blanket reduction anywhere up to 50% across the CBD. Um, we think the existing parking can handle it. Um, but again, as a city manager mentioned, we would love to get your feedback um, yeah. on that idea. Let's pause right there. Let's go back real quick to decorative. You don't need to move a slide. Councilor, are you okay with the direction they're going on the decorative crosswalks? Any, any problem with that? Okay, let's go to, let's give some feedback now on the parking. Go to your, uh, your slide seven, please, ma'am. Council, are, are you, this is the direction that, this is a, the direction that uh, staff is going with input from the, the downtown TIF and the master developer. Certainly it's part of the, the part of the, the, the plan. Are, are you okay with this, them continuing this direction? Okay, please continue. Oh, Ms. Patterson Harris, I'm sorry. Ms. Patterson Harris. With regard to the parking, is that what you're speaking to? Yes, ma'am, just specifically on that. Yes, ma'am. I was just, if I can take time to do this, I was just thinking if we're looking at a reduction in the parking, would that go to maybe even help the use of the transit system? Would there be any push for people to, for individuals to use that to make their way to the, to the downtown area or away from the downtown area? That's a good question. I do not know the answer to that question, but I can certainly visit with Mr. Mandrell on that. Ms. Joy? I'm just wondering, uh, if, you, if we had no requirements at all, would we do anything for those existing restaurants, brew pubs outside their businesses that they could, for example, they could say, okay, this many spaces outside of my restaurant would be dedicated to this restaurant, something like that? Because I can see that. I'm gonna let Brian jump in and see. Yeah. Sorry, I missed part of that. Can you repeat the first part of the question? Well, if you have no restrictions, yes, and, and let's say you had a two or three restaurants in the same vicinity, would one of those restaurants that's on the street, in other words, it would have street parking, mm -hmm. Would they be allowed to say these spaces for whatever restaurant it is only? Okay, so that's actually a question that's come up in other cities where the pu public parking could not be signed specifically for a specific restaurant okay. that is provided on city property. Um, and that's the direction a bunch of other municipalities have gone with it. Okay. That you could sign off street parking that's private, but not the public parking. That's for the public, it's not for a specific restaurant. Thanks. Okay, please continue. The next policy we are considering is power at the pole. And this really came um, from some feedback of some of our downtown business owners and event coordinators that um, could really utilize the power both at the street light where it's available and then what we have in the alleys for pop-up events um, and programming. And so one of the things I wanna point out about this, 
I, in the section of applies to, it does state that this would be um, in street lights for special events. Our current street lights, the majority of our current street lights in downtown would not allow for this policy. So there is a bit of an assumption that we um, will address the street lights themselves um, before we would be able to implement street light specific policy. That being said, we do have opportunities, again, in the alleys to provide power for special events through this policy um, with, you know, looking towards updated street lighting and pedestrian lighting with power at the pole um, for the public to take advantage of at a later date. The highlights of this policy, um, we would utilize the recreational street use permit process um, and just attach a power component to that permit. Um, electricity would be paid for upon application by the applicant and um, Lubbock Power and Light would be approving any of those requests. And so this would require that we create a new tariff for recreational street electricity usage. Um, and I will be working with LPNL staff to determine how best to build that tariff structure, whether that's a tiered rate, you know, based on um, how, day, number of days of an event or the power requirements for an event or, or something like that. We have not determined that rate structure yet. So, you would go to the city secretary's office to indicate that you would use need to use power, mm -hmm. and there'd be some fee, some bait, some flat fee for that. Correct. Correct. Okay. And as we upgraded power, as we upgraded light poles, you would integrate the uh, power capacity that you see in some cities where they have it on the down on the base of the power poles, and you're able to. To, to lock it when it's not being used. It's, I've seen that other places. Is that what we're talking about? Yes, and we actually have it right now in North Overton, okay. just as an example. The okay. difference with North Overton is those poles are metered, and so we're actually able to charge that electricity back gotcha. um, to somebody other than Lubbock Power and Light. Right. We don't currently have that capability in the downtown, so it gets a little bit more okay. difficult um, on the charging standpoint. You may have, you couldn't notice, but Mr. Goodman was watching you very closely. I think he's going to be, want to stand his band up at some places, and he's just trying to figure out where he can or can't do that. He so. gets charged a premium. Yeah. Okay. Uh -uh. okay. <laughs> Bobby G and the Flatland Ne'er Do Wells. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anything else on power at the pole? Okay. Let's move on, please. Okay, I wanted to give you a quick update on the Broadway Tunnel. We last spoke about this in our meeting on June 9th. Um, after that meeting, LPNL did send out crews into the tunnel, and they've really done a great job of trying to um, find parts in all of the places that they can. These fixtures are very old um, and no longer have parts available for fixing them. They need to be replaced. Um, but as we talked about last time, that capital project is on hold as a result of the impacts of COVID-19. Um, and so we estimate that they were able to fix about 30% of the lights that you see that are on in the daytime, about 70% of the lights that you see on at night. Um, this is a very temporary fix. When I spoke to them earlier today, something as simple as a thunderstorm can throw these lights back off. Um, so we are aware that this is, is very temporary, but we do have more lights working today than we did on June the 9th. Um, we are also working on the city side with a couple of our friends in the arts community, specifically Luca and Casp, on considering a design for a mural or public art. As we've talked about before, and you can see not really very well, but this is a, it's a very large tunnel, um, that there are aggregate panels that run the full length of this tunnel. And so that complicates things from an artist standpoint and from a, a painting standpoint. And so um, I use mural interchangeably with public art because we may not be looking at something that you would think in the general or typical sense of a mural where it's very intricate and highly designed. We may be looking at solid, you know, just painting those panels a solid color or something that's aesthetically pleasing. So we are working with Luca and Casp to um, get designs from a couple of identified artists. We anticipate that we will be able to submit two proposals for um, approval from the CBD TIF. 
Um, we did, city staff and I, owe a very big thank you to a couple of my friends in the engineering department who stood in the tunnel for a few hours and <laughs> measured panel by panel with me um, since I've seen you last. But we do now have dimensional drawings, so we understand the scope of this project um, that we've submitted, again, to our friends in the arts world for them to work with their artists for a design. Um, the CBD TIF board is prepared to discuss funding for this project at their regularly scheduled meeting, which is on July the 8th. Um, and if approved, we would be able to fund this project through their ex um, existing gateway fund. Ms. Patterson Harris. Thank you. Uh, appreciate this information, and I know that you indicated that you're working with uh, folks from Luca and Charles Adams Studio. Just a little, you know, I like to pick up stuff and sit it in front of you. I'm gonna sit this right in front of you. Thank Just you. on the other side of that, you have the Cavell's Museum of African American Art. You have the Roots Arts Historical Arts Council who might be uh, someone to contribute some information as we connect Thing. So I, I really want us to make sure that we have as much input and diverse input as we can make available to make sure that we make this really something neat. I'm not knocking anybody else. I'm just saying if you put potatoes, green beans, and all of that in the soup, it's really <laughs> going to be good. So I, I'm just going to put that there. If we want to reach out to some other folks who are also a part of that area. Uh, I, I would really appreciate just to see what they have. And when would this, this piece be available for a review? I, we are actually, our master developer, if he's still in the room, um, is headed to a meeting with Luca and Casp at 3.30 today to uh -huh. talk about the artists that they've settled on. So I would anticipate maybe 30 days. He's looking at me like that might be optimistic, but... Um, but yes, I would, I would say in the next 30 to 45 days. Okay. Is there any plan, and I hope I didn't miss this either, with regard to the lighting of them replacing to a new style of light so that the stuff that we put in now, you know, we're not having to... Uh, yeah. Are you suggesting you don't like that antique, uh, <laughs> that every fifth light antique white look, like, like circa around. 1966 or yeah. something? I'm just talking it's about what now. I'm talking about. That's okay, I'm just I'm wondering. I'm just, just wondering. talking about what I'm talking about. <clears throat> but more than anything, so that we're able, we have issues, we're able to get in there, do something about it. So I guess is the nice way to put that. Yes, so um, LPNL has a capital improvement project for that very thing. The current lights really cannot be replaced. We can't change out a bulb or you know what you would normally think of with a fixture. So that's a complete um, transition and replacement of all of the fixtures down there with LED fixtures. Um, that is a funded project that they are hoping that they will be able to move to next fiscal year. Um, depending on the impacts to their budget from COVID-19. Okay. I just anticipate this being the first step of, of a really great move, and I want to make sure that we do it well, and yes, we kind of capture everything that we can. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Patterson Harris. Ms. Joy? Well, I'm going to turn the heat up a little bit, because we've been talking about this and talking about it, and nothing's getting done. It was, money was set aside, or at least promised by LPNL to replace those lights. Um, and um, I think some of us need to have a conversation with them within their budget uh, to get that done. Uh, this is ridiculous. Um, it's taken this long to get 30% of the lights working, maybe, and then we start talking about the mural. We've been talking about those panels and painting those panels. Uh, Ms. Patterson Harris and I are not picky about what color to put on them, but painting the pair, uh, those panels. And now we're talking about having artists do it, but then I see this wording that says, uh, budget estimates for design fees, supplies and installation, is this not going to be a volunteer project? Probably not if you're going to have somebody, somebody a professional pay. That's what I mean. Yeah. Uh, do we really need somebody professional to do it? 
Uh, so the artists are like be no different than a doctor. If you ask a doctor to come do something for you, you'd pay them. I mean, I would think you'd pay an artist. I mean, these are not my my understanding of what you normally pay for murals. It's it's not exorbitant, but I think it would be fair for their efforts. But we don't have any idea, do we? At this point, it's kind of like the lights. We don't really we know there's some money set aside, but we don't know what the cost is. We don't know what the cost is on the mural. I'm just saying we just talk about it, and then we have another <laughs> meeting, and then we have another council, you know, work session. Let's get it done. Let's move on it. The crosswalks. How hard is that? That doesn't even require, I guess, money. It it requires approval. So I'm just saying, let's get it done. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Let's let people see that there's something that's coming from this money that we spent on this master plan. Yes. Okay? Um, we did have, we are working under the assumption, and we've talked to some other arts organizations that deal with um, murals, that about 2 to $3 a square foot is what you typically pay for a design on something like this. And so that's what we will take back to the CBD. We did not have this funded in their current budget but we are gonna try to um, push this forward and not wait for the next fiscal year so that we can go ahead and get this done. Mr. Chattis. Thank you, Mayor. Ms. Girardi. Yes, sir. You mentioned tunnel or tunnels. Two tunnels, right? Um, yeah, okay, yes. This is specific to the Broadway right. tunnel. Yes. Okay, I brought yes, up the one at Buddy Holly, Park, uh, Buddy Holly Street. Last City Council also is that part of the part of is that being considered also? It is not being considered as part of this project, but certainly something that we can look at. Okay, so the it it, it will be looked at. Yes, sir. And seems like it's always about time. <laughs> <laughs> if you were to put a calendar on that, would that be when? Um. Yes, the uh, Buddy Holly. The Holly Tunnel? Yes. That'll go back to the TIF and they'll be able to discuss it if they choose on July the 8th and see where they can put <clears throat> that in. Okay. At least we're looking at both sides of town <coughs> that, need, that, that, that needs it. Yes, sir. And I'm all in favor of the one coming in off of uh, Broadway. But let's, let's keep Buddy Holly in, in our sight. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. Uh, Mr. Griffith. Thank you, Mayor. Mr. Griffith again. Thank you, Mayor. We, Mr. Chattis is the, we're, we're, this is a tunnel conversation, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> I hear the echo. <laughs> is the, um, is the, are the lots out? On Buddy Holly Tunnel? Yes, they are, and they're also antiquated. They're the big old square lights. Okay. I appreciate your uh, it's, bring, it's bringing that up. But it just, it just goes to my point, and I'm not disagreeing with anybody on our council on this, but I think there's a more important topic than the murals, and that's public safety. And I think that we're missing the point that this needs to be done rapidly because of the public safety component. I know the Broadway tunnel, even, and I appreciate LPNL band-aiding the issue, but this is a public safety issue that needs to be addressed rapidly. Thank you, Mr. Griffith. Is, uh, before we go to the, your last item, is anybody from LPNL here? With all the masks, it's sometimes hard to tell who's exactly out there, so I just want to make sure I wasn't missing anybody. I'm sure they'll get. I'm sure they'll get the, the cliff notes. Mr. Chattis, do you have another point? Okay. All right, uh, Brianna, back to you. Let's uh, let's finish your uh, um, finish your presentation, please. Okay, the last thing I wanted to update you on is the Civic Park. As you'll recall, the master plan recommends that um, we create a living room space of sorts for downtown Lubbock at the current location of Lubbock Power and Lights building. Um, we have a, 
We, city staff, um, specifically the Parks and Rec Department, has drafted a request for qualifications that we could use to go ahead and move forward on this project. Um, and I've highlighted a few of the things that would be included in that RFQ here. Um, this is also on the agenda for the CBD TIF Board's July 8th meeting to consider possibly moving forward on um, potential designs for the Civic Park. Um, this would also be funded using their gateway funds. Okay, Council, uh, any, any feedback on, on, this, uh, on the next steps on the Civic Park? I think that's go forward, okay? Can do. All right, uh, we, I, we appreciate uh, Mr. Taylor being here, the chairman of the, the CBD TIF board, and Mont McClendon representing the uh, uh, downtown uh, developer. Um, do either one of you have anything you'd like to add for this, this afternoon? Okay, just look, just y'all are just uh, eye candy. Is that, is that what you're, is that right? Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you guys for being here. Brianna, thanks for your work. It's a, it's a lot going on. I know it's a, it seems like we're just having to create a slot for you on every work session. So uh, <laughs> it's like, uh, but thank you. Thanks for keeping things moving. We thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. Okay. All right, our, next, uh, our next item is the... Uh, COVID-19 update, and I will uh, turn to the city manager, Mr. Atkinson. Once I turn him on. Okay, Mr. Atkinson, like I said. Thank you, Mayor, appreciate that, and uh, I'll test the limit of my technological capabilities. I believe I'm connected to your click share. Put the presentation up. We're going on click share or East Podium input. I believe it is click share, Mr. Brown. All right, well, you're good. All right, you're up. There you go. Wow. Okay. So with that, uh, I'm going to provide an update, uh, kind of an ongoing deal, but want to focus, as you noted earlier, on today some good news. Some things are happening. Uh, people are being assisted. Your your community is coming to life. So, Council, on June the 9th, as you'll recall. You approved $2 million uh, in funding, and this is through our CRF allocation, for rental assistance, utility assistance, childcare and mortgage assistance. That same night, you also approved the creation of what we called the micro-grant program at $1 million. So a total of $3 million worth of programs approved that evening. I'd like to provide for you an update of where those stand in this two-week period of time. Rental assistance had a $500,000 allocation. That is fully obligated. So your community development department and our partners are moving, moving quick, and you're seeing the demand. We, we think more is needed. Utility assistance, $190,000 has been expended or obligated. That one's moving as well. Child care assistance, this one has kind of hit a bit of a roadblock. Our outside partner, the YWCA, is now in a position of having to request a CCS waiver through the Texas Workforce Commission. This is the child care subsidy program, and there is an issue where th this works somewhat like a subsidized housing voucher. We say this is the total, this is the subsidy. You are obligated for that difference. We're saying we have that difference, and we have a way to help these people please give us that waiver. That's in process. That can be done with your local workforce board. Mr. Aguirre is working with Ms. Mathis. We think that's gonna go, but uh, didn't wanna cause concern that that number's so much lower than the others. The mortgage assistance program is off to an extremely slow start. That's trying to get those connections plugged back in between our partnership and the banks. So they're working on that, but I'll show you some, some thoughts here in a minute. But if you take those four programs, $2 million available for assistance, um, in two weeks, 730,000 has been obligated or expended. So again, kind of keep your eye on that rental assistance. It'll come back later. The micro grant program, again, $1 million, 
$4,000 grants. We divided up based on income limits to try to drive the dollars where most needed, put a cap of income or revenue at 75,000. And here's your results on the bottom half of the page. There were 302 qualified applicants, the largest number in your smallest set aside block, which has the most money. So out of 164 qualified applicants in the lower category, 128 are funded. Your middle category had 105 applicants that were qualified for the program, 88 were funded. The largest category, 5001 to 75, 34 applicants that actually matched and consumed what we're trying to do there. So here's where it stands. 250 funded grants, that's the 1 million divided by the 4,000. We have 52 that we were unable to fund with your initial allocation. We need $208,000 and that will fund the entirety of your qualified list and we've got a way to do that and I'll show you in just a moment. I really do want to shout out for LEDA, Market Lubbock, the Visit Lubbock staff, the efforts they did followed really by Mr. Kostelich and his teams very quickly. This program announced on June the 10th, Wednesday, June the 10th, the first checks walked out the door yesterday. 123 checks left the building for these qualified applicants yesterday. I believe at the point we began work session today, we were at about roughly 190 blue. 165 and then not everybody that nobody has to come in blue staff called everybody they made contact with 249 out of 250 of those applicants they said they're here if you want them if not tell us and we'll mail them but council thanks to your efforts and to the program that was put together you have taken those federal dollars and we, we waited to get them but once we got them you put those dollars out to those folks who needed it the most very very quickly here here's how those grants broke out on a geographical basis. I'll attempt to expand that slightly. So this is in category one. This is the largest category. And you see the distribution there of your qualified applicants. We'll go to your middle category. Pretty similar distribution, really, on a geographic basis. So you see there are those that qualified. And then your final category, which again, this had the smallest amount of money available, had the smallest number funded, but of those that were qualified and funded, you see here the distribution of that. So the program started quick, it had to ramp up fast. I think it really, I think it really worked. And I think we've got a way to fund the rest of those. So it's kind of a, a wind up on that again. We're at 1.7 million or 3 million obligated. The micro grant program's fully funded, it's out of dollars. Same thing with rental assistance. Utility is moving and quick. Child care will accelerate. We need to get past um, this particular waiver that's being sought. Mortgage assistance, I hope to come back with uh, better news on its progress soon, but it is going very slow. So here's our thought. We can transfer 208,000 to the micro grant program from the mortgage assistance program that was contemplated in the resolutions that's council approved on June the 9th. We can do that without a separate action. Doing so will fund all of those remaining applicants. So everybody that you qualified will have received the assistance that was available. Your rental and your utility assistance programs were combined in our same outside partner. Let's treat that as a single, single bucket, a single pocket for the moment, and allow them to continue to provide that rental assistance. If one of those then becomes short, or if we come back and we seem to be short in the mortgage assistance, because we'll take the 208 out of that one, would remind council we did reserve $580,000 out of this piece of the CRF money, and we can come back and ask you to appropriate that. And Council, if I hear no comments otherwise, we'll implement this tomorrow morning. 
Okay, thank you. That, uh, oh, Ms. Patterson. Patterson Harris has a comment. I have a question in reference to those 52 that were, we were not able to serve. What's the breakdown on them uh, according to the three different uh, well, financial a, sections? And I'll, I'll direct your attention back to the screen. Uh -huh. um, the largest yeah. number will be in category one, the up to the 25,000. There's 36 of them in that. So 30, okay, there you, okay, I see it now what you're saying. The okay, because I was looking yeah. at the, the, there's a difference right there. Yeah, I did, I okay, apologize, cool. I didn't have that. So, so, so uh, basically those 52 will make, consist of the first two categories. That's right. okay. Entirely. And okay. two thirds of those the are in the, uh, in the lowest, low. on the, okay. low, on the okay. lowest, the lowest okay. uh, tranche. I, I missed that, thanks for pointing that out. I was yeah. just curious as to how yeah. they fail. A great question. Okay, please continue, Mr. Atkinson. Okay, if there's no further questions on where we stand with the CRF, I'm gonna do a couple of just quick slides. Um, some local activities, some state activities. Number one, there'll be an announcement soon. The beginning next Monday, the Patterson testing site will open five days a week. And the reason for that is obvious. We've been running it three days a week. Ms. Wells and her staff had expanded the number of appointments available and we still have demand. So. A lot of credit to Chief Fogerson and the men and women of Lubbock Fire Rescue. Those additional two days of staffing will be provided by the Lubbock Fire Department. The Burl Huffman Soccer Complex opened this past Saturday. And it opened <laughs> <laughs> and, and it opened with its first tournament, which is actually listed below. So we were able to do a grand opening and the kids were out on the field before we walked off of the podium from doing that. So Excited to see that come back to life. Other amateur sporting tournaments have resumed throughout town. Um, I think everybody uh, was aware of the USSSA softball tournament this weekend. There was a large basketball tournament this weekend. There's a baseball tournament this coming weekend. Um, just want to remind the council and the public, these events require those organizers to submit safety plans. They require them. Um, those are reviewed under the alert guidelines Ultimately, depending on the size of the event, they actually then are presented to the mayor. They come forward with a staff recommendation at that point. Um, we have asked organizers to go back and we think you should adjust this or adjust that or we're gonna expect you to do certain things. So far, all those organizers have been very willing to do that. We further then monitor compliance. And I wanna highlight we monitor. That's really all we have, but we do. Um, in all cases, the reports back from both your Lubbock Police Department and your Lubbock Fire Marshal's office this weekend was that all these tournaments, they did a good job. They really did. And uh, I spent time back and forth at the USSSA and starting Friday, that was a city unto itself and a significant number of those license plates were not from Texas. So we did have lots of visitors, they worked hard. Good reports back on the basketball tournament and soccer tournament was neat. Uh, three on three, they compressed those fields. I didn't realize how much so. The only complaint we had was the parents putting the lawn chairs on the new synthetic turf so they could be that much closer. So if that's all we have, that's easy. Four little leagues, your friendship youth baseball, <laughs> Lubbock senior softball have all resumed. Tournaments at the Burgess Rushing Tennis Center started back on the 15th. For all those waiting for another 100 degree day, the May Simmons and the Montelongo pools open this Friday. They will be open this Friday. Remember, we're limited to 50%, but they'll be there. Outdoor activities at the community centers start back up on July 6. We open for the interior July 20. My meal numbers are just a little bit out of date. I did this off of last week's report. Just under 5,000 curbside meals have been provided to the seniors in Lubbock over 400 meals to the kids that would normally be at our summer camps. That's just in two weeks. Your amphitheater will begin hosting performances again on June the 22nd. Moonlight musicals on July 9. We are already hosting events at the Civic Center. It's still a little sad, everything's so spread out, but it's safe and it's coming back. Garden and Arts Center opened on the 15th. Those are your local activities. I'm gonna jump into the state 
real quick. I think everybody saw last week uh, an announcement that came out of Austin that the Texas Alcoholic Beverage Commission was going to take over enforcement of the relevant provisions of Executive Order 26. Their announcement said, if we find a licensee, so your license to serve alcohol on premise, if we find a licensee in violation of that order, first offense is a 30-day suspension and the second is a 60-day suspension of that license. As of last night, TABC Austin announced that there had been 17 suspensions statewide, one of which is here in Lubbock. June 22nd, so yesterday, Governor Abbott conducted a press conference, kind of a not change in information, a change in tone. Uh, and that tone was that the recent in case, increase in positive cases and hospitalizations was unacceptable. Uh, and the governor made that very explicit. Equally explicit, though, um, were the comments by Dr. Zerwas and Dr. Hellerstadt. Statewide hospital capacity is sufficient at this time, and we do not have any major hospital that's gone into what they call surge. They're all pre-surge. At the same time, uh, both, both state-level doctors reminded us that the plans are in place to go above existing capacity, and any hospital that does that will be supported by the state. You might imagine there was discussion on state-issued orders regarding face coverings, and the governor again said no, but you are beginning to see some county-level orders that come out. <coughs> so we'll talk, <coughs> this final slide, we'll talk about that. Bear, Hayes, Travis, Hidalgo, El Paso, Dallas, Harris, and Nueces counties have all issued or announced issuance. There's also a couple of city level announcements that have gone out. We've tried to just synthesize what's out there. They're all relatively similar. So I'm gonna call out really the, the two key features we see in those uh, county level mask orders. The first is to require a business, a business to be required to develop a safety policy and plan. And that's the general term used. And that plan must, at a minimum, require that employees and patrons of the establishment wear face coverings. There's, there's obviously exceptions when appropriate. Would uh, call out that some of these orders listed above, note that there is a potential of a fine only penalty, but the penalty is issued against the business. Some remain silent. There, there, there is no call out to that. The second key feature you find in these face coverings or mask orders are that the public, and most of them say 10 and older, the public is required to wear face coverings in a public place, and again, they list out reasonable exceptions. If you maintain social distancing, if you're only with members of a household, certain exercise, act, if you're in your car, medical reason, things like that. All of them that I've read on category two specifically call out that there's not a civil or a criminal penalty. And of course, that's very consistent with the governor's order. It prohibits that and these honor it. The first category appears um, to me to be more keyed to a statement that's in the current governor's order that says a business may require face coverings. A business may require. So then these say, yeah, and we say that business you should require. Mayor, Council, I'll, I'll stop and attempt to answer any questions you may have and keep, try to keep us on time. So Council, um, let's, any questions regarding the, the COVID-19 update for Mr. Atkinson? Comments? Mr. Chavez? Thank you, Mayor. Mr. Atkinson, could you deliberate a little bit more on the, uh, the order that the governor put out Specific and no civil or criminal penalties will be imposed on individuals for failure to wear face covering because that's been it's 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 that's a question I'm having to field as to why Lubbock is not issuing a must wear masks or facial covering, but the governor's already said we can't cite people for it. The governor has said that it's in executive order 26. Um, we'll be able to speak to any specific legal questions in executive session today. Um, you are set up for that. 
But again, it seems to be a unique path as it relates to the businesses. But none of the orders that I have read on that public category, none of them assess a civil or criminal penalty, and they in fact state there is no civil or criminal so penalty, basically what and they do, that matches the order. They're just recommending, suggesting that they should, in not that they In will. strong language, they're saying you should, right. but there is not a, uh, a mechanism to compel it. Thank you, sir. That answers my question. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Tyson. Ms. Joy? Uh, Mr. Atkinson, <clears throat> in the governor's discussion, I think this last bullet point about public, generally 10 and older, require face coverings, is that the little nuance that the governor was referring to that some of these uh, counties and cities are using because they are accepting so if someone is social distancing then they don't have to wear a mask is that the little nuance that he was talking about in in my opinion only okay. the, the nuance that he's referring to is in the first bullet okay. so recall that the executive order says that a business may require a business may require what this first call out is, uh, and I'm specifically using the Bear County order, and you, you each have a copy of that, and it's highlighted. Mm -hmm. What it appears to be is the county order says, business, you must have a plan, and the plan must require masks. So it appears, and we'll, we'll field better questions in executive session, it appears that what that is telling you is the enforcement is against the business. It is not against the patron nor the employee. But the second bullet point seems to require everybody to wear face coverings in public places if there is no social distancing or you're a member of the household. And, and to me, that seems like um, somebody's taken something from the governor's orders and I say orders, there's more than one, yes. uh, to say that they can do this. What they are doing is saying no civil or criminal penalty, which there's not much enforcement, but I know we're going to be asked about these counties and cities that have this requirement. How do we answer them? I, I don't know that there's a good answer for that. Um, you have orders issued by several counties that say you must do this, mm -hmm. subject to certain exceptions. And then in all cases, they turn around and say there is no civil or criminal penalty for failure to do so. And in fact, if you give me just a moment, I may be able to pull that text up. Um, So this is the Bear County order. The bottom of that page, general public, all people 10 years or older shall wear a face covering over their nose and mouth when in a public place where it's difficult to keep six feet away from others. It calls out some CDC guidelines. It calls out some instruction to employees of the county. The highlighting farther down right there is what matches the order, the governor's order, I'm sorry. Well, to, to my knowledge, this, um, the governor has not challenged this order from Bayer County in terms of requiring everyone to, in public to wear masks unless they fall into this exception. Is that right? I, I agree with that. He, he's not challenged this. Thank you. Ms. Patterson-Harris. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. On a softer note, I just wanted to see, uh, we indicated on the local activities that community center outdoor activities will commence July 6th and the indoor on July 20th. What does that look like? I mean, what types of activities are we talking about? Is that just the uh, use of the facilities or, or what? It, it's, it's largely just being able to use the facilities and schedule them for events that are spread out. 
Um, we're, we have made arrangements. Some of our facilities that get rented for an event that when they're finished, we're able to come in and fog them and clean them and then if, if need be, set them off for a day and then bring them back, so. Okay, thank you. I just thought it was important to let folks know because I think that's really been a, a huge uh, concern from, for individuals wanting to have a gathering place because they're not available to other places, so that's good to know. Thank you. I agree. Okay, anything else for Mr. Atkinson? I'd just like to um, add, add to the uh, thank you for uh, the uh, large events last weekend and the way our, the way our team worked those and, and worked them up front and the, the community, uh, the folks that organize, the ones that are organizing those events. I know we've got uh, a baseball tournament this weekend, I believe. I'm not sure. I can't recall if we've seen that, that plan yet. Um, but. I, I, uh, we have seen it, Brianna. I, can't, I know we, I saw some yesterday, but um, we'll, we'll continue to learn every weekend. Uh, um, I've been asked a number of times about, you know, how do you, how do you safely um, have a baseball tournament or a softball tournament? I think you, you put in place, place the very best protocols you can with all the facts you have at the time, at the time, and you try to learn from what you do every weekend. I mean, I, we're. Uh, 60 days away from having 40,000 college students in our community. Uh, we've, got to, we've got to find a way to do that too. So we get, we get better every day. We work on it. We really, though, encourage our citizens to follow you know, those, those safety protocols, those personal safety protocols that can you know, protect them. So it's your, it's, your, it's, your, you know, it's your face covering, it's your, it's your hand washing, uh, it's your not touching your face and it's keeping your distance. And more, most importantly, it's common sense. I mean, don't start running with people you haven't been running with. You know, just be, right? I mean, it's a, you, you, you've, you've, you've been with your family, you've been with, you've been with maybe a bit of an extended group, but that, that needs to be who you roll with. And, and that's, a, you know, we're going to continue, as much as we're testing, we're going to continue to find positive cases. But we're watching our hospital capacity very closely, and it went, actually went down over the weekend. We went from 21 people in the hospital on Friday to 19 yesterday. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll keep watching that. But the vast majority of those positives in our community are young people. That doesn't make it right. But that's what we're finding. And we're continuing to message to them about um, how we can control the spread. And that will continue to be, I think, our, our, our effort. So, Mr. Atkinson, do you have something to add to that? You're back Thank on. You. Just to speak directly to your point, uh, as of last night, 567 out of the 1,407 cases in Lubbock are in the 20 to 29 age group. That's 40% of the totality of your cases in that one age group. And um, of our active cases, it's a much larger, larger percentage. As in of active that. cases, yeah. it is the majority yeah. percent. Yeah. Okay. Council, we'll move to uh, um, the uh, last thing I have for our uh, work session is I, I don't believe we have any polls for tonight. Uh, anything? Okay. So we don't have any polls. Council, is there anything you'd like to ask on the regular agenda that you'd like to ask staff about right now? Okay. Just as a, we're going to uh, go into executive session momentarily. We took about an extra half an hour uh, in our uh, work, or a little, ex a little longer in our work session. So just note to media and anybody who might be waiting for our to our resumption, Let, let's plan on it being between 4.45 and 5 tonight. We'll be just a few minutes, probably a few minutes later. The City Council will hold executive session today for the purpose of consulting with city staff regarding pending or, pending or contemplated litigation or settlement agreements and or consultation with attorneys under Section 551.071 of the Texas Government Code to discuss the purchase, exchange, lease, or value of real property under Section 551.072 of the Texas Government Code and 
to discuss personnel matters under section 551.074 of the Texas Government Code. It is 339 and we are recessed to executive session. Uh, good evening, everyone. It is 526. I'll call the Lubbock City Council back to order. Uh, we have returned from our executive session. Uh, we will begin our uh, uh, regular meeting um, uh, shortly. Um, but uh, before we do that, we will have our ceremonial items. Um, tonight, we, uh, our, our invocation is being led by Pastor Justin Stice. He's with the Co-op Church. Following his invocation, the Mayor Pro Tem will lead us in the, in the pledges. If everyone would stand, please. We have an amazing city um, to live in. And so, Father, we celebrate this city. We thank you that... Um, that you are in this city. And so, Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for the diversity of this city. And God, as we celebrate that diversity, God, I pray for unity in this city, a unity based in love, Father. Um, God, I pray just for a unity of love um, as we look at our neighbors and our friends around us, God, that we look and see how can I serve my neighbor? How can I love my neighbor? And so, God, I just pray for a unity of love in this city. God, I thank you for the leaders of our city. I can't even imagine what it would be like right now to, to be in leadership of the city. Um, but God, I pray, um, I, I pray comfort for them. I pray courage for them. I pray strength for them. God, I pray that you would continue to um, give them wisdom and discernment in how they lead and serve um, this city. But Father, we give you this time together as I handle the business of the city. In Jesus' name, amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state under God, one indivisible. Thank you. Justin, thank you very much. We appreciate you this evening. Okay, it's, it's 528. I'll call our, our meeting to order. Today is Tuesday, the 23rd of June, 2020. Lubbock City Council is in our regularly scheduled meeting. Um, our Our first order of uh, business is item five on our agenda, citizen comments. Uh, we've had no one sign up for citizen comments tonight. I think we have a number of citizens that are here for um, our public hearing, um, which we'll hand, re resume later in the meeting. Um, I'll, I'll go, we'll go through that in a few minutes. We'll go through just sort of the, the timing of all that. But let's go ahead and take care of our minutes. Our minutes are on uh, item six on our agenda. They begin on page 11. The minutes from the April 29, 2020 Special City Council meeting at the Lubbock Economic Development Alliance, as well as the May 26, 2020 Raider City Council meeting, the May 27, 2020 Special City Council meeting to discuss impact fee and land use assumptions, and also the May 28, 2020 special city council meeting, that public hearing for impact fee and land use uh, assumptions. All those minutes were included in our packet. Council, is there a motion to begin consideration of those minutes? Second. There's a motion by Mr. Massengale and a second by Ms. Joy. Are there additions or corrections to the minutes? Okay, all those in favor of the motion to approve the minutes as presented, please say so by saying aye. 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 Any opposed by that same sign? And motion carries seven to zero. Okay. 
Okay, we'll move to our consent agenda. It begins with item 7-1 on page 33. There, there have been uh, no pulls tonight on our consent agenda. So just as a reminder for those watching us or here with us tonight, consent, the consent agenda is comprised of items considered to be routine uh, that are enacted by one motion without separate discussion. If the council desires to discuss an item, that item is removed and considered separately. And as I just indicated, we don't have any uh, pulls tonight. So I'll open the floor for a motion on the consent agenda. Move to approve. Second. Got a motion uh, from Ms. Joy, a second from Mr. Chidas. Uh, all those in favor of approving the consent agenda, uh, please say aye. Aye. Uh, Any opposed by that very same sign? Motion carries seven to zero. Okay, council, we'll move to our regular agenda. Uh, the regular agenda is uh, uh, begins, it's item eight, it begins on page 343 with um, item um, eight one. Uh, before we begin the uh, regular agenda, just a couple bits of, 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 of housekeeping. One, um, uh, we're going to, uh, we're gonna ask everyone to be seated in the, uh, uh, in the chambers tonight with the exception of, uh, of media. Uh, and, and senior senior staff that have given up their seats so citizens, citizens can have a place to sit. We will do sort of a one in, one out. So if someone leaves, we'll have, bring somebody in. When uh, We do have overflow seating outside, which should um, uh, take care of, of, of anyone who's uh, uh, here uh, for, for any item. Um, certainly, uh, we have a number of, of regularly scheduled public hearings from planning tonight. And uh, we will take care of those tonight before we uh, resume our uh, public hearing from engineering. And that'll be, the, that'll be our last item. So 8-2 will, will follow, 8-2 um, will follow um, um, item 8-8 eight, eight tonight, okay? All right, so let's go to item 8-1. Item 8-1 is on page 343. Uh, Council, this is uh, the uh, the resolution that we, or the posting for a resolution that we've um, now had on our agenda for uh, a number of meetings in a row. It, it it gives us the ability, if we need to, to make a change to uh, um, our uh, disaster declarations re regarding the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. I, I don't believe we have any um, items, uh, any action on that tonight. Okay, so we will move to item 8.3. Um, item 8.3 is on page 405. Um, items 8.3, 8.4, 8.5, 8.6, and 8.7 are all public hearings. They're brought to us from planning. They're the first read of zoning cases. Council, if, it's, uh, if, it, uh, if it pleases you, uh, we will have Mr. Isom do, us, do us an overview of all of those, and then we'll decide how we wanna handle the, 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 the public hearing and how we consider the items, okay? Is that, is that fine, council? Did you include 8-8? I'm sorry? And 8-8, eight, eight. I'm sorry, you're right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Thank you. Okay, so let me get, uh, see if I can't get Mr. Isom on here. All right. Brian, please uh, please take it away. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Item 8.3 is case 355A for Prudential Enterprises, represented tonight by Hugo Reed and Associates. The request is to rezone property from Commercial District C4 to two-family District R2 at 2917 Idaloo Road. Um, the purpose of this is to construct a series of duplexes on the property. Um, 18 notifications were sent out, and we received none in favor or in opposition. Here we show the subject site outlined in orange, um, generally located west of Idaloo Road on the south side of East 7th Street. 
In this aerial, you can see the undeveloped nature of much of the property in this location. The existing zoning is C4 with additional C4 property along Idaloo Road uh, with single family R1 beyond to the west and a mix of single family and two family beyond to the east. The future land use map calls for light, retail and commercial along this portion of Idaloo Road. Um, here we show some subject site photos uh, that show the existing site as well as some of the development within the area. This slide is provided by the applicant showing the boundaries of the proposed rezoning request as well as a proposed layout that they would look to construct. So the future land use map does call for light retail and commercial in this area, but neither the existing C4 zoning nor the requested R2, R2 zoning fit into this category. However, the proposed R2 district could serve as a suitable buffer to the single family to the, to the west from the other C4 zone property in the area. The proposed use is compatible with both present and expected uses and development in the area, and the site has adequate public access and infrastructure, and the Planning and Zoning Commission recommended approval of this request by unanimous vote. Okay, thank you, Mr. Isom. Any questions, uh, Council, for I Mr. Isom on item 8.3? Okay, please continue to 8.4. Item 8.421, 8 if you're following at home. <clears throat> Item 8.4 is case 2577C for True 2005 REI LLC represented by Estacado Interest. The request is to rezone property from local retail district C2 and single family district R1 to general retail district C3 and commercial district C4 at 6101 Slide Road. We sent out 21 notifications and we received one letter in support and none in opposition. Here we show the uh, location of the support letter, the property to the north. Here we show the um, subject site outlined in orange, generally located north of South Loop 289 and east of Slide Road. Uh, this was previously the location of Toys R Us directly across the mall. So what you'll see is an existing zoning um, mix of C2 and R1 for the abandoned right of way with single family to the east and some general retail to the south with local retail to the north. Um, in this, in this uh, image, you can see a couple of um, different pad sites being cut up. Originally, this request was for C3 and C4, the C4 being the box store portion to the east. However, working with staff and due to the COVID-19 situation, the, um, the tenant has changed. And now they have a tenant that can fit into the three C3 zoning, and we've discussed it with the applicant, and they'll be doing the request now is for C3 for the whole property. And even though, even though it wasn't filed that way, if you look at the actual uh, ordinance, that's how it's styled. Is that, is that correct? That's how, well, that's how the ordinance is prepared. Okay, but the, thank you. We notified it as 3 4, C3, right. and C4, right. so that's why it had to stay. Okay, that thank way. you. Just, just to make clear, uh, planning and zoning approved it as C3, as, yes, not C4. That is correct. Okay, thank you. Please continue, Mr. Rice. So the future land use map does call for commercial in this area, slide road. Here we show some site photos that show the views up and down Slide Road, South Plains Mall across the street, and the existing masonry wall between the existing development and residential to the east. The application is in compliance with the future land use map and comprehensive plan, as this area is designated for commercial. And it's not uncommon to have C3 zoning abutting residential property as long as there's proper screening between the two, which there is a masonry wall between them. The proposed use is compatible with present and expected development in the area and has adequate access and public, public infrastructure. And the Planning and Zoning Commission recommended approval of the request for C3 for the whole property by unanimous vote. Okay, questions for Mr. Isom on 8-4. I want to please continue, 8-5, page 437. Item 8.5 is case 2800A for Prudential Enterprises, represented tonight by Hugo Reed and Associates. The request is to rezone property from Commercial District C4 to two-family District R2 at 1212 Martin Luther King Boulevard. Fifteen notifications were sent out, and we received none in favor or in opposition. Here we show the subject site outlined in orange, generally located north of 13th Street and west of Martin Luther King Boulevard. Much of the surrounding area, you'll note, is currently developed with single-family homes. 
and some non-residential uses along East Broadway Avenue. The existing zoning again is C4 with two family districts to the east, south, and west and a mix of C4 and heavy manufacturing along East Broadway. The future land use map does call um, for light retail and commercial within this area. And here we have some site photos that show the existing structure on site in the top left and some of the adjacent development up and down the street. While the future land use map does call for light retail and commercial in this area, the extension of the R2 zoning from the properties to the west may be more appropriate and could act as a buffer between the commercial developments to the north and the single family developments to the south. Um, this proposed development is consistent with present and expected development in the area and the property has adequate access and public infrastructure. And the Planning and Zoning Commission recommended approval of this request by unanimous vote. Thank you, Mr. Isom. Any questions on 8-5? Okay, let's move to item 8-6. It's on page 449. Item 8.6 is case 2895P for Robert Grimes. The request is to rezone property from Garden Office, GO, to local retail district C2 for properties located at 8705, 8713, 8721, 8901, 8905, 8909, 8913, 8917, and 9103 Milwaukee Avenue. The intent of the request is to provide additional flexibility in the allowed uses that would be able to go on the property for the different tenants as well as additional assigned standards that are really limited in the garden office district. We sent out 57 notifications and received one in favor and one in opposition. Here we show the location of the support and opposition. Um, neither letter that was submitted to staff really gave any opinion on why they were opposed or in favor. Here we show the subject site outline in orange, generally located north of 92nd Street and east of Milwaukee Avenue. The image shows the portions of the development that have already been con constructed as well as some of the vacant portions that are shown here are actually under construction at this time. The existing zoning is garden office with single family to the east and west and garden office and general retail to the north and garden office and general apartment medical to the south. Um, this would be, this may look a little bit familiar as the um, yeah. small cutout piece in the middle of all this was recently rezoned to apartment medical. The future land use map identifies office as being appropriate in this area. And the site photos show some of the completed construction within the development as well as what's under construction and the two uh, subdivisions to the east and west. While the future land use map does show that the site is designated as office, the proposed use wouldn't significantly change the intent of the map as this district would also allow for the professional office development to continue while allowing the flexibility to inc include other tenants. The proposed development is consistent with present and expected development in the area and has adequate access and public infrastructure and the Planning and Zoning Commission recommended approval of a vote by a vote of seven to zero with one abstention. Questions for Mr. Isom on item 8-6. Mr. Isom, I noticed in the, the proponent's uh, write-up that they were one of the reasons for asking for the zoning change was around signage. What, can you explain the, the sure. difference in the signage requirements on this? So in, in garden office, a, um, you're limited on the size of your signage, your wall signage and your monument sign. So for a wall sign, you're limited to 10% of the wall area of one wall or 5% of two walls mm -hmm. or 50 square feet, whichever is less. And typically you get stuck at that 50 square feet. Where um, C2 would come in is your so all site signage is limited to an amount based off of your lineal uh, frontage. Mm -hmm. So I picked an easy number of 100 feet. If you had 100 feet, you could get one and a half square feet for each linear foot, which would allow you 150 square feet of signage for your whole site, which means wall signs, monument signs. So for them, if they had no monument sign, they could actually have 150 square feet potentially for signage around their building. So that's what they're looking at is increasing that square footage. Thank you. Anything else on 8-6? Okay, let's move to item 8-7. It's on page 471. So item 8.7 is case 2933G for Beaton Bow Homes, represented by Chris Berry. The request is to rezone property uh, to two-family district R2 from single-family 
R1 with reduced setback for garden homes and two family districts at 9701 Upland Avenue. We sent out 57 notifications and we received one in favor and one in opposition. Here the response map shows both the support and opposition along 95th Street. Uh, while the opposition didn't include any reasons, the support did state that they felt like this development is needed in the area. Here we show the subject site outlined in orange, generally located north of 98th Street east of Upland Avenue. The existing zoning on site is R1 with specific use for garden homes and two family district. Um, again, this is another site that should look very familiar to you as the zoning for this was approved in April. However, due to some technical and layout issues, they're having to swap part of their development and it just seemed easier to go for straight R2 all the way around. The future land use map indicates uh, low density residential is appropriate for this area. And our site photos show the uh, single family subdivisions to the north and east and the remainder of the property in the area is mostly vacant. Um, the applicant has supplied staff with a proposed layout for the development which would yield a total of, I believe, 42 lots, as well as some images that they've provided um, for their duplex product. The proposal is in compliance with both future land use map and comprehensive plan, as this area is designated as low density residential, and R2 zoning does allow for single family homes as well as two family homes, which can act as a buffer between the, hard, the commercial on the hard corner and the existing neighborhood. The proposed development is consistent with present and expected development in the area and has adequate access and public infrastructure. And the Planning and Zoning Commission recommended approval of this request by unanimous vote. Okay, thank you, Mr. Isom. Any questions on 8-7, Council? Well, let's move to item 8-8, it's on page 487. <clears throat> Item 8.8 .8 is case 2955DD for Matt Sefcik of 5G Crown Point LLC, represented by Will Stevens. The request is to rezone property from Garden Office GO to High Density Apartment A2 at 7102 Ironton Avenue. We sent out eight notifications and we received one uh, in opposition and none in favor. The response map shows the opposition located across the street to the northwest. Um, this property is an existing apartment complex, and the opposition was um, essentially they were against adding any additional com apartment complexes to the area. Here we show the subject site outlined in orange, generally located south of Ironton Avenue and west of Iola Avenue. The existing zoning is garden office, or, um, with a mix of six different districts in the immediate area, including high density apartments to the north and south single family to the east, and four different commercial districts to the west. The future land use map does identify this area uh, as appropriate for high density residential. And the site photos so show some of the undeveloped state of the subject site with additional construction occurring to the east and to the north. The future land use map does designate this area as appropriate for high density residential, so the request is in conformance with the land use map and comprehensive plan. The proposed zoning is compatible with surrounding area as it is merely extending the existing A2 from the north and the site has adequate access and public improvements. Planning and Zoning Commission is recommended approval of this request by unanimous vote. All right, thank you, Mr. Isom. Any questions on item 8-8? Okay, thank you, Brian. We may call you back, all right? Council, um, how, do you, how do you wanna handle this? You wanna do the public hearings together? There's, are there any of these you want to consider separately? What's your, what's your, what's your, uh, together? Okay, all right. So we'll both hope, we'll hold the public hearings and consider these together in, in a moment. Let's, uh, <clears throat> let's open the public hearings for items 8-2, 8-3, 8-4, 8-5, 8-6, 8-7, 8-8, 8-9, 8-10, 8-11, 8-12, 8-13, 8-14, 8-15, 8-16, 8-17, 8-18, 8-19, 8-20, 8-21, 8-22, 8-23, 8-24, 8-25, Let's hold the public, open the public hearing for items 83, 84, 85, 86, 87, and 88. I will uh, open that public hearing now. Let's ask anyone in opposition to any of those zone cases to please come forward. Anyone in opposition to 83, 4, 5, 6, 7, or 8?
Okay. Uh, how about any proponents? Anybody in favor of 83, 84, 85, 86, 87, or 88? Evening. Good evening, Devin Ferris, Estacado Interest, Fort Worth, Texas. You said to come and speak if uh, in favor, correct? Sure. I'm the applicant on the old Toys R Us rezone. Uh -huh. I think it was case 8-4. Eight, 8-4, four. Eight, four, yes. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you guys have. Okay. Any questions for, for Mr. Ferris on item 8-4? What's your plan for the property? We're going to lease the old Toys R Us building to a regional plumbing, electrical, and mechanical hardware retailer called Lock Supply Company out of oh. Oklahoma City. And then we're going to put a Murphy Express gas station in the parking lot, and we'll have a third pad we'll put a quick serve restaurant on. Good. All right. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh -huh. Any other proponents of any of the uh, the zone cases, uh, 838485, 86, 87, 88. All right. We'll close the public hearing. Council, I'll open the floor for a, uh, a motion to, to collectively consider items 83, 84, 85, 86, 87, and 88. Move for approval. Thank you, Mr. Chat. Thank you, Mr. Chattis. Second, and thank you, Mr. Griffith. Okay, Council. Any discussion uh, do, uh, on the the motion on the floor? Any? Do we need Mr. Eisen back for anything, or we we good? Uh, Ms. Patterson, here, so turn your mic. Hit, hit your butt, your button there, please, ma'am. Okay. Okay, Ms. Parishioners. I don't. I was hoping that Mr. Homer would would jump up there when his stuff came, because I just wanted to be sure. I see it on here. I know it indicates A2, but I believe the plans are for actual single family houses. Am I correct? Uh, both requests are for R2. The the first one you heard this evening, item 8-3, we are planning on building duplexes Duplex, at that location because yeah, we're right, right next to the Idaloo Highway. Yeah. On the other one, we're platting that for a single family. Okay. Yes. Okay. That's all I have. I was just, I saw that on there. I just wanted to be clear because I know how Mr., sometimes how Mr. Uh, Castillo asked for stuff to be 8-2 and he looks at doing single family. So thanks for that information. So that'd be 8-3 and 8-5, right? Is yes, that sir. right, Terry? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thanks. All right. Anything else for Mr. Holman? Okay. All right. Thank you. Council, any other comments or questions on these uh, questions for staff? Okay. Got a motion uh, on the floor to approve items 83, 84, 85, 86, 87, and 88. Uh, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed by that same sign. Motion carries 7 to 0. Okay. We'll now move to item 8-2. Item 8-2 is on page 344. Uh, before we um, resume the public hearing, uh, I know we have a quick update from staff on this one. I'll turn to, to Mr. Atkinson first. Thank you, Mayor. That is correct. Um, Mr. Mike Keenum is here. Mr. Whitaker is here. They have an abbreviated presentation. Uh, Council, you've seen this before. Uh, the items that are in the presentation tonight, though, are those that are strictly focused upon the item that's before you tonight, that being the land use assumptions uh, and the capital plan. So, Mike, you're Jeff going to begin? Looks like Jeff's going to begin. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Good evening, Mr. Whitaker. This is going to be a relatively short version, basically what was presented in the previous public hearing, but for those who are watching for the first time, we wanted to have the opportunity to make sure that they were understanding what was being adopted tonight. So this is a continuation of the May 28th public hearing, and remember that tonight we're here to consider the service areas, the land use assumptions, and the capacity plans. Comments that may be received during this presentation could affect the actual report that gets presented. Um, Mr. Whitaker, can you switch that your oh. laptops, we go into presentation mode, please. It'll give a little, I think it'll be, 
And I'm not sure how do you do that in PDF. I'm sure there's a way to do it. I know you can get rid of the, the tiling on the right side there. Looks like we've got some help coming here. There we go. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Okay, please continue. So we've had several meetings with council. This is the first time we've had a meeting. Most of the meetings that we've gone to, nine answers to the questions that came from the last public hearing. Okay. 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 okay, you're on now. This is the list of the previous council meetings we've attended. The most recent council meeting was on June 9th in which we walk through some of the questions that were received during the, the May 28th public hearing. If you recall, the city is divided up into service areas. The important item about service areas, when we collect money from those service areas, they have to be spent within those service areas. For water and wastewater, it's relatively simple. It's one service area for the city. For roadway, we divided that up into service areas, and those service areas are on the map as you see in front of you. For growth projections, we looked at various growth projections, what the Capital Improvements Advisory Committee decided to move forward with was what was recommended in Plan 2040, two and a half percent growth rate. Um, the map to the right shows the areas of the, the potential growth, that is number of people that are gonna move to this area um, for the 2040 plan. What was considered for growth was the upcoming census year. Oftentimes during the census year, we see somewhat of a recorrection in the, the amount of growth. The regional medical hub, growth of the area universities, and really there's an intentional focus on retaining graduates from the university, um, continued anticipated growth and building permits that have been seen, and really the uh, historical heavy growth when communities reached around 250,000 folks. That was some of the background of the reason why 2.5% was chosen. If you summarize that by service area, that really gives you a population increase of 76,843, and we divvied out the um, population throughout the city as in the map indicated in front of you. Um, highlights to point out this, service areas to the south, such as service area F and service area E, had a larger portion of the population, and some of the other service areas where you expect there to be less population growth or less. So it kind of followed the trends that you see that are currently happening in the building permit. Um, the capacity plans were based on master plans. So the roadway capacity plan was based on the master thoroughfare plan. The water and wastewater master plans were based on their respective plan. What the capacity plans are looking at is a 10-year window. So we're looking at what are the needs in the next 10 years. For the roadway capacity plan, if you recall, we walked through the methodology that was used, known as the universal projects approach. We identified new arterials, widening arterials. We also included completed arterials, which those were roadways that were built in anticipation of future development, as well as intersection improvements. One thing to note on the roadway side, we removed right away as a recommendation of the CIAC review. For the wastewater and capacity plan, um, these are the 22 projects that were identified. Note on the wastewater capacity plan that the existing projects were removed per CIAC review. Similarly, on the water capacity plan, happens to be 22 projects as well, and the existing projects were removed per CIAC review. The CIC actions, the first action they made was on September 5th, 2019, and that was a recommendation for approval of the land use assumptions and the service areas that I presented. And then on March 9th, 2020, they recommended six to one for the roadway, water, and sewer capacity plans that were presented before you. So today's action is the public hearing, the continuation of the public hearing. Um, council has several options they can do. They can prove as presented, approval with further comments, um, with approval with modifications before the second public hearing. And the main purpose of this public hearing is to incorporate the comments so that when the second public hearing happens, the plan is known of what is being included. It's important to note that this public hearing is not making the policy recommendations. It's not improving an impact fee rate. And the final report is not adopted until the final ordinance is adopted, which is at the second public hearing. With that, that was the brief overview of the presentation for tonight. Okay, thank you, Mr. Whitaker. Any, any questions for, for Mr. Whitaker?
Okay. So, thank you, Jeff. Um, Mr. Keating, anything to add? Okay, I want, I want to make sure that, that council and those here that were clear that, that the, uh, the item in front of us tonight and the public hearing are related to really two items. Land, the land use assumptions that Mr. Whitaker just covered and the capital improvement plans that Mr. Whitaker covered. If we approve that the if the if we considered and approved that resolution tonight, it would go back to the the SEAC, the advisory committee of citizens, for them then to make uh, uh, another set of recommendations, bring us another report, which we would um, receive and have uh, future hearings uh, prior to uh, a potential vote. Uh, to consider adopting impact fees, okay? So the public hearing tonight, the comments need to be pursuant to not really whether you like impact fees or don't like impact fees. What we're here tonight is to hear your input on what we've got to make a decision about. Land use assumptions and the capital improvement plans, okay? So um, I want to make sure that's first and foremost that that's, that's clear. Second, um, um, we, we did this three weeks ago, or we did, it, we did it very well. We had a lot of good input, um, and we had a very civil discussion. I expect it to be that way tonight. No clapping or jeering. Um, we, we want to make sure that everyone is heard, and most importantly, we need to be out of here, and some of us, that's getting a little more challenging every day, okay? If there is someone outside who wants to speak, when, when we'll, we'll, have, we'll have the opportunity to bring those folks in too. We're not going to preclude that, but um, we, we expect that, um, that that be handled that way. One final thing, if your cell phone is not silenced, please do that now. And Mr. Atkinson, unless you have anything else, I'll, we'll go ahead and get started. Okay, so we're going to resume the public hearing uh, for... Uh, uh, land use assumptions and capital improvement plans. And I'll open the uh, um, floor for citizens that would like to speak. Good evening. If you would uh, do us the, the pleasure of reading uh, your name and address, re starting with that, so we can get that in the public record. My okay? full address? Uh, you can tell us the block of the street you live on, but we need your address. Okay, yes. it's Jennifer Moore. I live on the 1900 block of 52nd Street. I'm in District 2. I'm in District 2. Come, come forward so we can hear, so we, so we can hear the lack of touch here. any COVID stuff here. Okay. Um, I, I may be off uh, base here, and I apologize if I don't understand the full, uh, what your explanation was of eight. 8.2, uh, uh, but I believed it was also about the the plans that was the um, extension and having that additional capital improvement, which would then affect having impact fees in the first place, is if we did those expansions, then we would have to address impact fees. Is that not correct? Because if we're not talking about impact, if we're talking about expansion, then, then we'd have to talk about paying for it, and paying for it would be through partially through impact fees. It could, it could be. We don't do right. it that way today, but that's it, something that we're considering. Right. right. So I just wanted to know if, if that's the case. If we're talking about expansion, then we can talk about impact fees because part of that is if you approve expansion, therefore we'll be discussing as long as, impact as, fees. Yeah, I, I think as long as your, your comments are, are, are pers you know, pursuant to the land use assumptions or the capital improvement plans, then they're, they're germane tonight. Okay. Well, that's what I'm not. I'm not certain that in your. Once you get started, we'll, okay. I'll help with that. Okay. All right. All right. So I've been a resident for 37 years in Lubbock. Um, I currently live inside the Loop in District Two, and my neighborhood has inherited a lot of the problems that were the North Overton. So that migration affected my neighborhood. Um, the response I receive when I talk about my neighborhood in District Two um, is just to leave. Why do you stay? Um, why can't you just move to South Lubbock or somewhere else? So the response or the uh, resolution for many people is that I just flee my community to a different place. And so, but I don't want to abandon my community or my neighbors. 
My whole life living in Lubbock, I've seen the same cycle of old, the new becomes old, um, and that just keeps going on. I've lived in South Lubbock where at one time, Honey Elementary was the new school, that's where I went, and then Evans, and then that was old, and then it was Irons, and now it's Friendship. And so we keep kind of leaving behind those pieces of the city, and they're not being revitalized. So we talk about expansion, what we're talking about is let's move that inward into the city to keep those places going and to put more effort in that, and that maybe one of those ways is through impact fees, having it be zero impact within, now I, said, I saw the map, maybe not inside the, the loop is an exact, but something like that where we're talking about old Lubbock revitalization and not having it paid for by the continued of new Lubbock, which will eventually also become old Lubbock and cost us money. So um, I just can't, uh, I can't understand it. I do understand it now. Um, and I don't want to have my community crumble and the, the fleeting profits for a few. So I'm asking for no impact fees inside the loop as a general area and a few specific target areas and maximum impact fees outside the remainder of loop or in this particular discussion, no uh, growth expansion. Having that revitalization moved in, inside the city limits. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Moore. Good evening. Mayor, Council, how are you all tonight? Good, thanks. I will be brief. I have a few handouts here I'm going to pass around. Jordan Wheatley, 11201 Norfolk Avenue. I'm the Impact Fee Task Force Chairman. Uh, again, representing the West Texas Home Builder Association, the Lubbock Apartment Association, the Lubbock Association of Realtors, and the Chamber of Commerce. Some total of about 4,500 member companies and multiple thousand employees. Uh, since our last hearing, I've ha I have had good conversations with Mr. Keenum. Uh, he has answered our questions uh, pursuant to what we're talking to about tonight. So I appreciate him being in good, good contact with me and our group. So I have distributed his, his answers. So uh, our position has not changed. We're still in favor of an impact fee if the number is right. And we know that's in the future. And that's not for tonight. We're still adamantly against impact fees for water and sewer. I've since gone back and looked at the last 10 years of water and sewer enterprise funds and the future five years of the budget of the same fund. Five highlights that I took away from my study are in front of you tonight that I passed out. Total revenue over the last 10 years of the water and sewer enterprise fund has increased 57%. I know there's been talk of a 2019 being somewhat of an anomaly, but if you look on that same chart, 2014 and 2015 went down two consecutive years only to rebound and increase and increase the next three years until the, the 2019 year that it went down some 10 million in revenue. But overall, I, look, I tend to look back at things over 10 year periods rather than just one year. But over the last 10 years, this fund has increased 57% in revenues. The total net assets of this system has increased 88%. Talking about net worth, this is almost double in 10 years of this fund. Current Reserves beyond the 25% reserves currently today are at 22 million beyond the 25% that is required. The future five year budget also reveals that the fund will continue to keep up with demand and the amount in reserves beyond this 25% required increases to 40 million in 2025. Yes, that's just a, a budget, but that's that's what it's, it's stated online. With a total of 80 million in total cash and projected in 2025. This fund and in this budget 
and in the current budget includes $212 million in projects over the next five years. Since this fund has kept up over the last 20 years, which we can, we can safely say that 20 years has been a pretty robust growth period for Lubbock, I believe and we believe this, this fund will continue to keep up. The city will only stand to further benefit due to infill development in the north and northwest as projected by the population map, map and by the, the slide that the consultant showed tonight. In the north, infrastructure has been in these areas for decades. This is why I'm personally been developing north of 19th and am developing currently north of 19th. The infrastructure is there, the city will win big on these developments. To conclude tonight, we just ask that this council remove water and sewer impact fees from this study and this process. That's all I have tonight, so appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wheatley. Other speakers. Good evening, Drew Gray, 6502 Slide Road. It is my honor to be serving as the current president of the Lubbock Apartment Association. The LAA has over 500 members representing over 26,000 rental housing units. One of LAA's top priority is to preserve and promote high quality affordable rental housing. Rental housing is the most basic form of affordable housing. Keeping rental housing affordable is key to the development success of Lubbock. We do not want to inadvertently increase the cost of living without providing a higher quality of housing or increased amenities. First, I'd like to discuss with you the 2.5% growth rate being used currently in the study. I believe the SEAC committee has mentioned that growth rates don't have a dramatic effect on roadway impact fees, but I believe it's important to get it right regardless. In the 2018 water plan, strategic water plan, on page 2-1 under population growth, it was referenced that the expected population growth in Lubbock would be 1.2% through the year 2038. Secondly, in the executive summary of the fiscal year budget 2019-2020, on page 7 and page 8, dated October 1st of last year, it mentions the prior 10-year population growth in Lubbock averaged 1.6%, and the expected growth for the next five years is between 1.5% and 2%. Therefore, with those two numbers, why is 2.5% population growth accurate for an impact fee study, but not the city's budget or strategic water plan? My point is that the numbers should be accurate, even if it doesn't matter. However, I'd request of Mr. Whitaker if he would be willing to explain if a 1.5% growth rate was utilized, would that change the water and wastewater capital improvement plans or the LUACP drastically? I re request the council endeavor to, to have a realistic and accurate growth rate used in the planning of these fees. Lubbock is widely known to be a pro-business community with a low cost of living. And I did bring a quick slideshow, one slide to be clear. Can I plug it in here? Lubbock is widely known to be a pro-business community with a low cost of living. This has allowed Lubbock to excel in job growth while promoting a high quality of affordable housing. And I want to highlight this example. In Lubbock, the average monthly rent for a new construction apartment is $910 per month. There are five other cities that Lubbock has been compared to in discussing impact fees, and these are their monthly rents. This is average new construction monthly rent San Antonio, $1,350, New Braunfels, 1170 
College Station, 1750, Denton, 1425, McKinney, 1337. The average of those other cities is $1,406 per month for a new construction apartment. Lubbock at 910 represents a cost savings of $500 per month. I'd say it's pretty great to live in Lubbock. All of these cities recommended here or listed here have, have impact fees. And I think this paints a very clear picture of how Lubbock is an affordable market compared to most other cities with impact fees. Every half a million dollars in impact fees directly increases the monthly rent to a resident by $20. These increased rents will then allow other older existing projects to raise their rents, thus creating a trickle-down effect of rent growth throughout all properties here in Lubbock. This will end up, end up affecting all renters negatively and adding to the cost of living. Currently, a newly constructed apartment complex located in South Lubbock, as proposed today of proposed impact fees, would incur over $400,000 in impact fees. That's a substantial number that shouldn't be taken lightly. Therefore, I'm questioning if $20 more per month on new construction residents is something we should be considering. Lastly, I'd like to pre present a very compelling case study on Plano, Texas. In the year 2009, Plano decided to start to stop charging impact fees due to their rising concerns of stifling development growth in their city. To date, Plano has been a leader in both commercial and single family development in the last 10 years in Texas without having impact fees. So to conclude, with roadways being the pressing need, we agree roadway impact fees need to be considered. However, to avoid unnecessary cost of living increases and using other cities as an example like Plano, I'd recommend not considering water and wastewater impact fees due to the sufficient funds available now. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Thank you, Mr. Gray. We may call you back if we have questions. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, Billy. <clears throat> My name uh, to the mayor, good to see you, to the city council, and to the city staff. I'm a little nervous. My name is Billy Russell. I live at 1822 East 24th. And the reason I'm here today is um, I'm on a committee, but um, I uh, got, I want to tell you about me getting interested in the 2040 plan. And I remember, uh, uh, Mayor, when, when the council just okayed that and, and was 100% behind that. And I see since we're getting into the impact, uh, the impact fee plan that we are following through on that. And uh, today I want to talk to you from my perspective, and I know you will stop me when you will, but uh, uh, as far as the impact fees, uh, it's okay to have the impact fees, and I know you know it's okay, but uh, in the area where I live, uh, I just say that no impact fees should be attached, and we ask, how do we attach it? But um, with the, with the new developments of Lubbock and the new housing area. I live in uh, the east part, and I know north and east Lubbock, I don't seem to see them addressed on any of the, uh, on any of the maps. So uh, for me, and I'm speaking for me, I feel that uh, we have a, a, such a good wealth. We're doing great with the downtown area. And I have gone off my script. We've gone, we're having good in uh, downtown area, uh, but we've kind of lost old love. Okay. I would like to have impact fees for the new development and for the new um, uh, sub housing, but none for old Lubbock and none for the area in which 
I'll be up. Thank you, Ms. Russell. Other people that would like to comment? Anybody? For, oh, yes, sir. Good evening, and uh, my name is Adam. I actually right now live at uh, in the 7400 block of Avenue X, which is, uh, I'm not sure what district now. Uh, for most of my life, I did live in District 2 in East Lubbock. Um, I have prepared something, so I don't waste too much of your time. You'll have to excuse me. I'm not up too much on the technical terms. Um, I do know that what I'm speaking to um, or what I'm in favor of is the same thing that Ms. Billy uh, Russell just spoke about, which is the no impact fees inside the loop, but um, and and obviously impact fees outside of uh, that, especially concerning the new constructions in Southwest Lubbock. Um, but I'll just read off my preparation thing and I'll cut it a little bit even shorter than what I had. So. Um, I'd like to start by saying that I speak for those citizens of Lubbock who are very rarely heard in these types of meetings. Um, citizens who not only are often ignored, but whose opinions have been outright disregarded at almost every turn when it comes to policy decisions in this city. Um, citizens who know that they live in a different world in comparison to other parts of the city. Um, I know this because I speak as a person of color who was a teenager in the 90s growing up in East Lubbock. Um, I know many of you may not know what that means. Um, let me tell you a little bit about that. I speak as a grandson whose grandparents and parents had to bear witness to signs on many uh, establishments in Lubbock that read, no colored Mexicans or dogs allowed. Even in the 60s, some, uh, some of us were told that houses weren't sold to our kind just minutes from where we were living in East Lubbock. The stories from even one of our families about dealing with inequality would be too numerous to list here and have had generational consequences. Um, what we need now um, is actions that, up, that uphold equality in the standard of living here in Lubbock for everybody. Um, as me personally, as a young person of color growing up in that sort of environment, and to many people living in those communities still to this day, um, I felt like life was so hopeless that the odds were stacked so against us that I became just another troubled teen in the streets. Now, I was able to turn my life around. I'm a business owner. I'm a great father. I have two, uh, excuse me, had two amazing daughters. One of them took her own life. Um, but I was able to turn my life around. Um, many of us weren't that fortunate. Um, and, and much of that has to do with old policies and continued policies. Um, the policies of the city council have dire consequences on our communities over generations, and that's why I cannot just stay silent and sit idly by another moment. Um, I, as well as many others, have now read the Lubbock Disparity Report, which I'm sure you have heard about. Um, make no mistake, this report did not have to give us any ideas. This, re uh, this report simply gave us data to back up our life experiences. Therefore, in the spirit of movement in a more equal and positive direction for Lubbock's future, I'm asking that this city council start to take the steps now, at this critical time, to start doing what's right by every citizen, not just a select group. This city council is in a unique position in Lubbock's history. You all have the opportunity to be on the right side of history being written now and to start this city on a path that is beneficial for everybody not just in words, but in practice. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. <clears throat> Mayor, <laughs> Council, my name is Jim Beck, 5632 Duke Street, Lubbock, Texas. I'm a missionary in Kenya, a long-term minister at Carpenter's Church, Open Door, and a professor of missions and Bible at Lubbock Christian University. And with all due respect and sincere compassion and concern, I offer words from the prophet Isaiah 10, 1 through 4, because I believe at least some of you, or perhaps all of you, respect and honor the words of our sacred text, which speak not only of personal morality, 
but also of social responsibility. The prophet says, woe to those who make unjust laws, to those who issue oppressive decrees to deprive the poor of their rights and withhold justice from the oppressed of my people, making widows their prey and robbing the fatherless. What will you do on the day of reckoning when disaster comes from afar? To whom will you run for help? Where will you leave your riches? Your decisions today and every day are concerned with people, often poor people, not just fees and properties and laws. If we ignore the existing neighbors in our already existing neighborhoods inside the loop, and focus on new neighborhoods with non-existent neighbors, we as a city fall short of the ideas of our faith and also of our neighbors. Please consider no impact fees inside the loop and maximum impact fees outside the loop. And may God give us all ears to hear what his spirit says. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Beck. Um, I would remind, I just would remind speakers that um, we're not considering tonight um, policy items as to um, if we um, implement impact fees or if so, if they would be uh, imp different in, in differentiated in a different part of town, okay? Tonight's dis, um, dis, uh, policy or decision for us is to adopt a resolution um, speaking specifically to the, the report supporting the uh, land, use, land use assumptions in the capital improvement plans, okay? So just um, I think that's worth, rem worth reminding folks of that. Next, next person that would like to speak. Okay. Um, Jessica, will you make sure that there's no one outside that would like to speak? And if, if there's, if, assuming there's not, then we're gonna close the public hearing. Looks like we might have somebody coming in right here. Evening. Hi, I'm Cannon Roberts, 6806 Frankfurt Avenue. Um, we've heard a lot from the special interest groups tonight. And one of the justifications of why we need to keep expanding Lubbock and not make our developers and builders pay their way is because we have a $910 average apartment rental. Someone making minimum wage cannot earn that much money in a month. They can't earn that much money in a month. So it doesn't matter to them. It doesn't matter whether the apartment is $910 or 950 or 30 or whatever the amount they threatened to charge was. That, so the development that we need inside of Lubbock to take care of old Lubbock, to take care of the communities that have been around for generations that put most of you in the positions that y'all are in, those are the communities we need to take care of. What we have heard from, from these builders, are threats that if you do not give what they want, they will punish the working people in this city. That is what we are deciding on today. Do we continue to do what the wealthy in this town want? And do we continue to expand the city so that people who make wealth can run away from the rest of the city? Or do we take care of the whole city? And some of the development that was in the disparity report, those were things that the 34th Street Association suggested. And they either couldn't get it past city employees or they couldn't get it okayed by the city council. These aren't new ideas. And the threats from the wealthy in this town are not new either. And that is what we're seeing tonight. Because it's really easy for them to pay these sewer and water fees. They just have to cut into their profits. That's not what they're, that's what they're unwilling to do. 
This is not an unreasonable thing for us to ask. It is not unreasonable to ask that you take care of the city that's there first. The other thing we should do is look at, the, look at Memphis. Memphis continued, Memphis, Tennessee, they continued to annex more and more um, of the outskirts of their city into their city until they went bankrupt. Because when we keep expanding into South Lubbock, then that puts more pressure on our garbage pickup, it's put more pressure on our solid waste, and it takes longer. And so what happens is that South Lubbock gets the focus because they're the ones who make the most noise. And that's fine, that's what happens, but we need to be aware of that. And right now, our city leaders throw their hands up and act like they don't know that this is an issue, that they don't know that it's the people who have time. It's the people in South Lubbock who have time to look around and complain about their neighbor's grass. They have time to do this. The working class in the city does not have time to do this. They don't have time to show up to these meetings. And because of that, we ignore them. And we listen to these builders who have more than enough money to pay these fees, who have more than enough time to, to do incremental improvements within our community. It's just going to cut down their profits a little bit. So that's the decision that we're talking about tonight. Do we let greed continue to run the city? Because it has for a long time. Or do we start to take care of people? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. Yes, sir. Mr. Mayor, uh, City Council. I, my name is Marcus. I live on the uh, 3400 block of East 14th Street. I just moved here about five months ago. And uh, I've heard some disturbing things. I've seen a few things that are kind of disturbing to me. And, and, and I hear land use assumption, and I, I'm wondering what's going on because people are talking about expansions here and expansions there while other parts of this city are decaying. And I've only been here five months, and I can see that. I think you all have been here a lot longer than I have. And I'd respectfully request that everyone here take a time to drive down some of those roads. Take a drive down Martin Luther King Road. Look at some of the despair in the businesses and the buildings in those areas. Look at how they're treated. Before you consider expanding into new areas or new land uses, how about fixing the areas that we have? It's amazing to me that, that this hasn't been more addressed in the past. And without wanting to bring up a bunch of political argument or discussion of what's going on in the news and TV, it's amazing to me that this has happened because I've heard nothing but racial disparity since I moved here. Talking about how the east side of Lubbock is not the place I want to move to, as was suggested to me by a home inspector because of the color of my skin. Now, I don't know because I'm not from here, but when I hear these things and I see them, in the five months I've been here, that brings into a huge, that makes me question everything. What's going on in this city? And you all have a duty, in my opinion, to serve the citizens equally and fairly. Now, when some of these folks come up here and they talk about, on another note, when they talk about expansion and fees and land use appropriation and whatnot, are people considering the, the long-term effect? Because I just came from a city that grew from 5,000 to 11,000, from 11,000 to 20,000. One of the reasons I moved here is because of the inherent cost that came along with that and the cost of living that was raised because of that. The gentleman brought up a good point just before me that, you know, rents were, you know, difficult to meet for people of an, of an average low-income family or even an individual. And that's very true. I personally have lived it most of my life. I came from a poor background. I've lived in foster care, grew up, went through the military, did my thing. I've, I've seen a lot of disparity. Those people have a hard time making those payments, and when you have to raise the payment of the sewer, for example, like in that particular city, it went from $9 fixed fee to 
overnight because they had to do an expansion where they had to expand the capability of the sewage treatment facility. The water doubled in price inside of two years. It, the amount, and these are not costs that go away. They're permanent. They stay there forever. And for somebody that can afford to buy a home, my, my home payment, you know, to throw it out there, is a little over $800 a month right now, including insurance and everything. That's less than the rental. Shouldn't we be looking at trying to get people into single family homes instead of approving all these housing projects or duplexes? There's plenty of room over on the east side of Lubbock. I've seen lots of land there that's empty. These developers could go over there and build single family homes that wouldn't cost more than the average rent. Why are people not considering these things? And those are my basic questions to y'all, because I don't know enough to give you the answers. I haven't been here long enough. But I hope God guides y'all and shows us the right way to do it. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Leanne Lambines. I live at 4207 40th Street. It's kind of in the heart, middle of Lubbock. Um, and I wasn't planning on speaking, but I had said on Tuesday morning that this city council meeting needed to be attended by taxpayers and ratepayers because all I was hearing from were apartment association folks and realtors and people with interest in developing in Southwest Lubbock. So, um, and, I, and I, I think that the topic that's confusing some people is on the uh, capital improvements and land use assumptions. And I wanna say that I think these people are addressing that because it, especially the capital improvements amount. Uh, our, our issues because since that meeting I have read the report and I agree um, upon reading the report it makes sense to me that if Lubbock is going to um, survive as one city the inside old part of Lubbock including Jeff Griffith's um, district that I'm that I'm in um, the cost of development in Southwest Lubbock and West Lubbock and Northwest Lubbock needs to be covered in its entirety by that development, not by taxing and increasing rates on people that have lived here in communities that have been here for over 100 years at times, parts of them. That isn't fair. Um, and Meanwhile, I've looked, the last time I looked at the city uh, debt, it was $1.6 billion. The cost of really developing and um, um, revitalizing older parts of this city, and especially parts where the uh, people of color have lived and been segregated two on a historical basis, those monies could go so much further there in uh, addressing those disparities, but also everywhere. The roads, the cost of, of doing roads can be so high, and the long-term uh, impact, the impact fee does not address long-term capital improvements or long-term maintenance of those capital improvements. So that's what I have to say. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I believe that. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Jacob Reynolds. I live at 2618 38th Street in Councilwoman Harris's district. Uh, members of the city council and city staff, my name is Jacob Reynolds. Um, I am a native son of Lubbock. I'm currently a third year law student at Texas Tech, Reckham, and plan to begin my career serving my community as an attorney next year. 
Now, growing up here, I witnessed firsthand, you know, all the fantastic growth we've been talking about, uh, the suburban sprawl in southwest Lubbock, uh, and the growth of the Lubbock community, but I've also seen the subsequent economic and infrastructural decline in the part of the city that I now live in, within Old Lubbock, uh, within Loop 289. And while I may not have been able to always articulate in detail why this transformation took place, I, along with many of my fellow Lubbockites, some of you who've you've heard here tonight, have always understood that beneath all that shiny new development out in the West End and Southwest Lubbock was growing economic and racial disparity in my hometown. Now, fortunately uh, for us, the economic and political forces driving Old Lubbock's decline have been thoroughly outlined in, in a recently released report on how development in Lubbock South and Southwest are being enabled by taking resources from the rest of the city. Because of this, I'm here today to speak in favor of including impact fees in the bigger picture of Lubbock's expansion to the South and Southwest. And, you know, and, and I know that uh, all of the expansion and the land use uh, assumptions that we're talking about tonight, these are included in that. We must view impact fees in this bigger picture. It's one tool of many that we must use to stop the exploitation of old Lubbock so we can use our limited resources for revitalization. Even if the new subdivisions bring in property taxes in the beginning, we know that they will not carry their own weight when they begin to require maintenance. The same maintenance many Old Lubbock communities are in desperate need of today, but are not receiving because our resources are being used for the benefit of suburban developers who we've also heard from tonight. So for these reasons, I ask the City Council to impose maximum impact fees on new developments outside the loop and no impact fees on Old Lubbock developments within the loop. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reynolds. Okay. Council, um, we're going to we're going to uh, um, close the public hearing um, by closing the public hearing up. I guess sort of begins a shot clock. We've got 30 days to make a decision on this, uh, on this item, although we're, we're, we have an opportunity to make that decision tonight. But just want to make sure that we, we, we mention that. Um, I'd like to um, uh, have Mr. Keenum come up for a minute. Maybe um, I'll just start. If you, need to, if you need to get some consulted help, we can do that in a minute. But let, let's, uh, let's just make sure on a couple things that we... Um, first of all, um, uh, the capital improvement plan that, that um, we're considering tonight and it's part of our ongoing budget that we, we look at every year that's adjusted in our budget and, and some of the modeling that we look at, particularly the, the um, uh, uh, reserve, you know, the re reserve calculations that we had above policy reserves that we looked at tonight, I think, that Mr. Wheatley talked about. Um, those, those are largely funded by by what, Mr. Keenum? For water and sewer, they're solely funded by the rate payers that pay into the water and sewer fund. And those rate payers are people that when they're paying their... Their water, their water bill. Their, their Lubbock utility bill, right? Yes, sir. Okay. And if I recall correctly, they also include um, significant uh, rate increases over, I mean, I say significant, a dollar, maybe beginning in 2021, a dollar a year for four years. Is that, is that correct? Yes, sir. Or something think, like I, that? I think in the, the current budget that we're operating in, the forecast showed a dollar increase per, on the base rate for water every year for the next five years. And then years. that's as far out as the budget goes. And then I think the sewer rate had a nickel increase every year on the base rate okay. going forward. Now, go. let's go backwards for a minute. Uh, this year, the budget we're in today, there was no um, rate increase for water or for uh, wastewater. I think we might have had a nickel increase on the on sewer, for, on sewer for the current year. I think that's right. <clears throat> yeah. But the water rate remained the same. Yes, sir. The year before, it changed, as I recall. Do you remember what that was? I, I do not recall, uh, but I, I believe you're right that it did change to some degree. I might have to defer Mr. to Mr. Atkinson, Atkinson, can you help with that? 
rate base rate was increased while at the same time we added the amount of water that the base rate buys we, we increased that by 1,000 gallons and the actual dollar change I'd be afraid to call it out but uh, that rate increase was designed to accommodate our smallest rate users and, and our smallest volume users and allow them to basically function within the base if they chose to they don't have to okay thank you Okay, on another another line of questioning. Just quickly, I think um, there was a, somebody commented earlier about the uh, a developer when you talk about improvements that are being made, that a developer shouldering all the cost of something like that. Um, and I know we're not on the impact fee percentage yet. We're just looking at the first step. But remind folks that the state law is pretty detailed around around um, how much impact fees can be and, and there's going to be some degree of sharing uh, regardless uh, right and but, that's isn't that correct yes sir that's exactly right so we you know in the in the report that's before you tonight we've got total cost of those projects and then the next step it fact figures out the recoverable cost amount and so that whittles it down to what is needed for the growth in that 10-year window and then what's beyond and so the only part that's into the fee that would be calculated would be that recoverable cost, and that gets cut in half uh, by state law, but by the way we adopted it. And so, at least by half. At least by half. That's exactly right. And okay. so, um, yes, there's definitely going to be sharing. The developers would not shoulder 100% of that burden. This is still going to be um, paid for by ratepayers and taxpayers as well, but uh, that would be just a portion that would be to help share and, and defray those costs that we could use for maintenance or other things potentially. Okay, that's all I have for Mr. Keenan. Anybody else have questions for Mike? Ms. Patterson Harris? Say that last part that you said, Mr. Keenum. So if if the impact fees get adopted, then that defrays some of the cost and the burden because it provides an additional revenue source. And those costs could be used, the cost that's defrayed could be used towards maintenance for existing infrastructure that's in place. That part right there. Uh, I have a question. How does new growth impact our current water and wastewater system. What happens when we bring the new growth in? What, what takes place? What, what type of impact does it have on our systems? Well, and, and so with the, the new development, you know, developers build the infrastructure that's interior to their development. They build the roadways interior, the residential streets. They build water and sewer pipelines inside their development today. The large transmission lines that come there, the improvements to the treatment plants, that's all funded by the ratepayers, And so those are things that we need to provide that infrastructure to these developments so our city can continue to grow. Um, but all that currently is funded by ratepayers. And there might be a case where a developer has to bring a water line out to him and, and he has to pay for that and adjacent mains as part of what the existing process is that would be looked to be revised if impact fees get adopted. Um, but, but yes, so the city has to plan for the development to see these infrastructure needs where growth is occurring how we provide water and sewer service to that and then roadways to get out there to that and so those are all large costs uh, that, that we have to pay and you know it's got to be paid for somehow and it's just a matter of determining how that gets paid for and, and at the current moment that's being paid for by ratepayers ratepayers or taxpayers yes ma'am okay uh so when we're having to hold on hold on just a second you answered it all. I just had all my notes. I want to make sure that you covered it. Thank you so much for that information. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Joy. Ms. Joy. Uh, Mr. Keenum, I noticed on the water capacity plan there, there is nothing listed there for uh, the expansion of Cremwa. That is correct. And is there a reason why it is not included? We, we did not feel that that was going to happen in the next 10 years. We weren't sure of the timing of that, and so that was not a project that was in the list um, to be included at this time. And I think I asked you, when we were here before, um, what the projected cost would be just for Lubbock, who's just one of the partners in that. Um, and at that point, I'm not sure you knew. Have you reviewed that since the last meeting? I've reviewed it some, but I have different numbers, and so I. I I'll defer back to the city manager on that one. <laughs> I, I, I said 95 million before, and and some people thought that was high. I've I've heard that that's in the ballpark of what our share. I know we have about 40 percent share of what that total cost is whenever that gets built, and so 
it's going to be a large sum of many, money for sure. How important is water? Mr. Atkinson might be willing to comment on that. And M Mr. Yeah. Keenum's <laughs> on the right track. It, is Crimwa has been able to, to try to push that project farther out in the future because of what local cities are doing. It's really to the point the budget for that project is a range. Uh, and you could have Lubbock's portion somewhere in the mid 80s, 80 million. You could have it up you know, a little bit over 100. But, and, and Mike's right, if the project can't be done, the, the dollars have to be expended within that 10 years or, or it's a refund and mm -hmm. there would be no point in charging them uh, to do that. How important um, is water to the city of Lubbock? Extremely. It's hard to have a city without water. Yeah, if we, if we don't uh, protect our water sources, uh, either through conservation uh, or simply through new sources, uh, then we won't have any future development, will we? No, ma'am. And, and I'll just quote from Mr. Spear that he said several times, our cheapest water is water that's conserved and not used, so. Okay. Um, this council has tried really hard to hold those rates down. Um, it's been an issue at every budget session. And that's how the 1,000 gallon uh, uh, proposal came into being, simply because there are people in this city who do not use more than 1,000 gallons because they can't afford it. And so um, it would appear to me that in order <clears throat> to hold down those costs, we're going to have to have some help. Would that be... Would you agree with that or not? I think that's a fair assumption, yes, ma'am. Okay. And I just want to reiterate what the mayor said earlier, that a vote for impact fees does not mean that everybody pays the same. They, we have the ability to waive impact fees on a certain um, area, uh, and I want everybody here to understand that, that uh, if there is a vote for the land use assumption today and those capital, those capacities, uh, that's not doing anything to say who's going to pay an impact fee. That's correct. Tonight okay. would basically just be the, if you voted on taking action on the resolution, just to continue the study. And so the second public hearing and the ordinances and the policy decisions would all be the next step. And so whatever decision you'll make tonight or within the next 30 days. Uh, that gives the, the committee direction on proceeding on or changing course. And so that's, that's kind of where we need direction from this body within the next 30 days to say, what is our charge going forward? Do we continue with the study the way we're going or do we, do we change course? And the committee you're referencing is the SEAC. Is committee. the SEAC, yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Keenum. Better sit down. Sit down before somebody else wants to ask you a question. Yes, sir. I'm sure you'll be back. <laughs> it's, not it's not my birthday anymore. <clears throat> Mr. Griffith, thank you, Mayor. The uh, there's a lot of discussion about streets and roadways. Mr. Atkinson, um, you were kind enough to pull some data for me, but I'd like for you to, if you don't mind, share with everyone on the dollars that are spent within side Loop 289 versus outside Loop 289 uh, over the past five years. You have that. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, have that item pulled up. <clears throat> Question uh, has been asked, you know, street maintenance is a major focus of the city and it's a driver as we try to put together capital budgets every year and of course where, where do the dollars go? Um, over the last five years uh, in Lubbock, We've spent uh, $34.2 million. 
inside the loop, inside of loop 289. We've spent $18.6 million outside loop 289. So not quite a two to one delta with the weight to the inside rather than to the outside of the loop. And uh, that takes you back to the 2015 budget. And the current street projects that we have going this summer, some that won't be done, actually finished until next year, correct? That are inside the loop. Aren't it Benson, Monterey, Clapp Park, Medical District south of 19th. 19th. Also, uh, Ms. Patterson Harris's district. It's called the Harwell. Harwell district. So all those projects are underway inside the loop. And some won't be finished till next year, correct? That, that, that is correct, sir. So for the, uh, for the 2020 budget, our, our current budget, and of course the street maintenance season has really uh, just over the last four to six weeks kicked off. Uh, location of the projects and the cost of each would tell us that uh, within the loop, uh, this year's $10 million, 8.5 will be spent within the loop, 1.8, almost 1.9 will be spent without, and that adds to a little more than the 10 because we carry over what we're not spending from the prior year. It doesn't give it, we don't give it back, we make street maintenance bigger. Um, sir, not included in these uh, in these numbers, the, uh, the program that this council initiated a few years ago to do the dirt road residential program and convert those to paved streets, of course those are inside the loop as well with one exception. Are those one, included in these numbers? Those are not. No. Th these are street maintenance. Okay. Um, that is a separate program. Um, that is also a program that in addition to the uh, general fund dollars that come out each year, we have made uh, tremendous progress with the use of your community development block grant funds. And some of those in large numbers, $900,000 at a time. Still not enough. Absolutely not enough, no, not enough. No, not enough. But uh, we are making progress and I'm proud of that. Yes. Thank you. Um, Mr. Keenum, sorry. Or, or Mr. Whitaker, I should say. Th there's been discussion on our growth number at 2.5. There's been a lot of talk about that. Is there, um, if that number were to change, what does it do on roadways? Have you, have you looked at that, what it would do if it was 2%? So in, on the work session on June 9th, we, we showed you what 2% would do to roadways, and it, it decreases just a little bit, about $3 uh, for, per service area at, at most, if we went from 25 to 2% growth. And then we've run numbers on water and sewer as well, and so that would reduce the total dollar amount by $37 if we, if we went down to 2% instead of 2.5%. So it's a, it's a very minimal change, and if, and if you recall from our previous conversation, because we're lowering both the numerator and the denominator mm -hmm. of the equation, so your net result is, is pretty similar. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Ms. Joy? Mr. Keenum, prior to 2012, <laughs> sorry, you got off there fast. <laughs> I was prior taking the mayor's to, advice. Yeah. Prior to 2012, how was the city financing street maintenance? Street maintenance prior to 2012? Mm -hmm. Was that when it was in the stormwater fund? I know it was in stormwater for a while. Yeah. It was debt? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And uh, gradually, uh, this council, with the assistance of city manager, uh, have been able to increase that annual street maintenance up to 10 million. But prior to 
to that, we, we had it in the stormwater, uh, which was dead. Yes, ma'am. Uh, that was being paid by ratepayers. Ratepayers. Okay, thank you. Mayor Pro Tem. See, I didn't let you get down. I stayed this time. Th thank you, Mike. The new Cremwa line was brought up by Ms. Troy a minute ago and, and Mr. Atkinson. And yes, all ratepayers have paid for, uh, for Cremwa water for years. So if you build a new line, bigger capacity, where does that water go? All over the city. All over the city. So all ratepayers still would be paying. Yes, sir. Okay. I just want to understand that not to scare folks with that future project, that, but it is for everybody in the city. Thank you. Mr. Massingill. I just thought it would be important to clarify for those in the audience and those wa wa watching, Crimwa is the Canadian River Municipal Water Authority. It is where, it is, so if I explain this correctly, it is the vehicle by which we are partnered with Amarillo and we source water for our water supply from the Roberts well fields and used to include Lake, Lake Merida. Merida. It still does. Still does. And still, still does. When, when it has. We blend it, we blend it together. Yeah, when, it, when it has water. water. Just so everyone knows what Cremwa is. And there are a number of other smaller cities, but Amarillo yeah, is our that's right. largest that's right. partner. But we have the and the investment that Miss Joy references is the aqueduct that was built in the 60s it's that really is wonderful. decaying, more decaying infrastructure that would, uh, at what point in time need, we needed to make that investment would be sizable, would, would certainly be out of the water fund. So one question um, that got asked of me yesterday was the concept of double dipping. Uh, a, a, develop, well, a developer would get hit twice by impact fees be, because of the fees uh, associated with the adjacent mains. And you referenced it earlier, but if this council, not tonight, but when we finally get to the point of whether impact fees get approved, those, what would happen to those adjacent main fees? So that's, that's part of the study that the consultants would look at to say, because we recognize that would need to be changed uh, because we don't want to double dip. We don't want to charge people twice. And so that, that is an antiquated process that we use already. And so we're looking to modify it regardless and depending on the outcome of how the impact fee discussion goes and the decision that, that this body makes, we'll outline how that changes. But absolutely, that's the consultants are going to look at that and make recommendations that if impact fees are adopted for water and sewer, the adjacent mains process has to change so that we're not, you know, people can't game the system to either make money off of it or be charged twice right. for that. And so absolutely, we know that we would need to revise that. Okay. I, just, I want to make sure we contemplated that. and I. I uh, I think some people will appreciate that that's an antiquated system and that we recognize there needs to be a change there. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mesco. Mr. Chattis. Thank you, Mayor. Mr. Keatum, reference was made to the debt that we had earlier this evening. What's the debt on our water to get it from point A to point B? Was it ballpark? I do not have the answer to that. I don't know if Mr. Atkinson does or not, or even, I don't know if Blue's here would know that or not. I do not know the answer to that off the top of my head, sir, but we okay. can find that out. I would just try to kind of verify the numbers because it, it is a great expense to get water into Lubbock because there's no, we're not bucketing water from anywhere nearby Lubbock. And, and, we're you know, we're big, piping everything, correct? Sure. Well, a big part of our debt for the water is the Lake Allen Henry project that we're still going to be paying on for some years. To, and that's to how build far? It. Excuse me? How far is that? To the distance? From Justiceburg, 45 miles. 45 miles? How big is that? How big as, is that? as the crow flies, it's you know, yeah. about a 45, 50 mile pipeline. Um, Mayor and Council, the portion of your debt that is water, your outstanding total debt that was referenced earlier, it's just a little under 600 million, I believe. Yeah. It's a big expense. It's a, it, it costs money to get water to us. Absolutely. 
I just kind of wanted to clarify that. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chattis. All right. Thank you, Mr. Keenum. Looks like you're clean for now, at least. For now. Okay, Council, is there, is there a, um, what, what else is on your mind? Other questions for staff or, or uh, um, uh, comments or is there a motion to, to consider item 8-2? I make the motion for approval. Motion. 8.2. 8 8.2, okay. There's a motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Uh, I'll take that from Ms. Joy. They were, I think they were, they hit at the same time. Um, sorry, Ms. Patterson Harris, you get the next one. Um, okay. Further, any, any, so council, I just want to re, re, um, uh, reiterate that we would be, we're considering the resolution on item 8-2. quick it's a little unusual but I think it's important that we be it resolved by the Lubbock City Council the city of Lubbock that in accordance with the Texas local government code section 395.045 the City Council does hereby approve and adopt the land use assumptions and capital improvements plan related to the possible adoption of impact fees as recommended by the capital improvements advisory committee or SEAC, said land use assumptions and capital improvement plans are attached here to incorporating this resolution as fully set forth herein and shall be included in the minutes of the Lubbock City Council. And then it, it provides the, the, this document right here that Mr. Griffith is so, he's put it out so he can make his notes on it and uh, which I believe is the Basically, the substance has the maps that we saw earlier, um, has a great detail of, of what we've we've talked about. So, Council, that's what's that's the, the motion. Mr. Chattis's motion uh, is to approve um, that those that report with the land use assumptions and the uh, uh, capital capital improvement plans. Is there further discussion on that um, on the on the motion? Okay, um, let's, uh, we'll do it, we'll vote by uh, um, using our, uh, um, uh, if I can remember how to do it, we'll start a vote here, we'll use, use our technology to vote. You should be able to see the, the vote um, on your screen. If you would just uh, click either uh, yes or no or, or abstain. All right, so that motion carries seven to zero. I believe that that completes, well, I, I did, I, yeah, we, I think we decided that on 8-1 that we don't have anything to, to yeah, yeah, I, want, I think we, we mentioned that when we went by it, so, okay, okay. I believe that takes care of our business. Ms. Garza, is that? Are you, uh, is, That's correct. Okay, Mr. Weaver? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, we, uh, uh, we have a three week break before our next council meeting. We meet again on a Tuesday, the 14th of July. Um, we ask that uh, you uh, um, uh, enjoy the 4th, 4th of July holiday safely. Uh, it's a great day in Lubbock, Texas, and we're adjourned. Yeah, wear your mask. Bye.